Have you ever wanted to integrate video calling into your app, but thought it was too complex or time consuming? What if I told you that you could build an enterprise ready video and audio experience and add it to any app in just a few hours, not weeks or days, hours, and not just any experience, but one that scales to millions of users and thousands of call participants. Hi there, and welcome back to JavaScript Mastery, where I not only show you how to build real world applications, but also dive deep into the why behind every line of code. Today, we're taking on the challenge of cloning a video calling app that handles more than 300 million meetings every freaking day. Day. Before we dive into the code, let's take a quick look at how our app works. At the start, we must create an account. We'll do that through Clark's beautiful sign-in component, which is completely free and allows for multiple social sign-ins or just your typical email and password login. Once we're in, we can quickly initiate a new meeting, redirecting us to set up our camera and microphone. As soon as you join, you'll see a familiar video setup where you have full control over every aspect of the meeting experience, from recording the meetings to sending emoji reactions, sharing your screen, adjusting audio and video devices, changing the grid layout, viewing the list of all the participants, and individually managing each participant. We have the option to exit the meeting or end it for everyone. Returning to the home page. If you'd like to schedule a future meeting, simply put the details, date, time, and voila, you'll find it ready on the upcoming meetings page where you can either copy the meeting link to share it with others or start it early. You can also view all the meetings you've held in the past with the previous meetings list, including their recordings on this page. You'll also have your own personal room with some details and a unique meeting link, which you can share with anyone for an instant meeting. Let's not overlook that you can also join meetings created by others by simply providing a link here. And just like that, you're ready for the meeting. Rest assured, all of this is incredibly secure, real time, and responsive. That was a lot, wasn't it? We'll use the best technologies out there, including TypeScript and Next.js 14, as well as Tailwind CSS and ChatCN for sleek, modern styling. And there will be no code to blindly copy and paste. Instead, I'll ensure you understand every aspect of the development process and the reasons why we do things a certain way. Plus, we'll follow a Figma design and write every single line of CSS together. This course isn't just about building an app. It's about understanding how to apply these technologies in the real world so you can beat Devin and become an expert developer. This app is made possible thanks to... Wait, hold on a second. Another third-party tool to handle this? Why not build it ourselves from scratch? As developers, we know the importance of not reinventing the wheel. Third-party tools enable us to focus on developing unique apps rather than getting slowed down by the specifics, like in this case, complexities of video streaming. This approach not only saves time, but significantly improves our skills, making us better developers. But do the big companies you'd want to get hired in care? And the the answer is yes. The software you learn today is being used by Adobe, SoundCloud, Gumtree, Crunchbase, and many more. The name, Stream, and it allows you to implement scalable, enterprise-ready video, audio, and conferencing features quickly and easily, absolutely free of charge without even requiring a credit card. They have pricing plans, but these are mostly for enterprises. And the cost for hosting and managing the entire infrastructure on our own is lower than something like AWS. Learn to embrace these tools to make you a more powerful developer. Finally, let's dive in and create something incredible. And make sure to stick around to see how I approach one of the trickiest features I've coded in a video so far. To start developing our Zoom clone application, we'll begin from bare beginnings by creating a new empty folder on our desktop. Let's call it JSM underscore Zoom underscore clone. Once you have it, drag and drop that empty folder onto your empty Visual Studio Code window. As you can notice, we're starting slow from bare beginnings, but we'll quickly ramp up the complexity and the importance of concepts you'll be learning about and the difficulty of concepts I'll teach you. And as I said at the start, I'll teach you every single little part of this application with no copy pasted code and completely free tools, starting off with the biggest of them all. Next.js, the React framework for the web. Of course, we'll be using Next for its built-in optimizations, dynamic HTML streaming, and server components. 
alongside Next.js, we'll also be using Tailwind CSS, a utility-first CSS framework packed with utility classes that make our styling easier. And building just on top of it, we'll use ShadCN as our component library of choice that allow us to easily pick and choose off some of the pre-built components, but then apply our own complete styling to them using Tailwind. So let's initialize our application by going to ShadCN UI and then click Get Started. Here, we can navigate over to Installation and choose Next.js. We can copy the first command, open up our terminal, and paste it. There's just one tiny change we'll make to this command, and that is remove this my app and replace it with dot slash, which will initialize the project right within our existing directory we just created. Let's press Y to install the create next app CLI, and let's answer a couple of questions. Would you like to use the source directory? No need. For most of these questions, you'll just press enter to speed run your way through it. So yes, 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 just enter, 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 and the dependencies are getting installed. While they're getting installed, let's also run the ShadCN UI init command to set up our project. So we can copy it and back within our editor, simply paste it and press enter. Once again here, we'll just press enter, 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 and we're gonna install everything. Now, what just happened? Well, if you look at our file explorer, you can see that we got a few new files, such as the globals.css, where we're importing Tailwind. We also got a lib folder with the utils where Tailwind CSS just added some stuff for us so we can easily consume all of its class names. And finally, it also added the Tailwind CSS config, which we can later on modify to make our styling life a bit easier. Now, going back to the docs, the next step is to install the font and some further customizations which you can do if you want to. In this case, we'll be using our own font later on. And there we go. You have your own new app structure and that's it. So we can test out if ShadCN works by adding a new ShadCN component to our project. So let's copy this command from step six and paste it right here. MPX ShadCN UI latest add button. What I love about ShadCN is that it allows you to add specific components to your project and it adds them directly within components UI right here. So you can even modify the source code if you want to. Not that we need to, but you can if you want to. So you can choose exactly how many components you're adding and you can only add the ones that you actually use. So going back, we can copy this homepage to see if the button appears. We can navigate over to page app. And by the way, if you're wondering how I just did this without opening the file explorer and then clicking on page, I used a command or control P shortcut, which allows you to search files by name and then quickly traversing over to them. This is just one of the many pro tips I'll scatter throughout this video. So now we can remove this entire homepage and paste what we copied over from ShadCN. Finally, Let's run npm run dev to run our application on localhost 3000. Command or control click it to open it up. And here we are. I'm gonna zoom it in so you can see it a bit better. But if you have a button that looks like this, that says click me, it means that you have successfully installed Tailwind CSS and ShadCN and that we're good to start creating the file and folder structure of our application. So going back to our code base, we can open it up and see what we have here. We have the app folder, which is the most important folder right here, especially considering that Next.js uses a system called file-based routing. So depending on which folders you add here and which pages within those folders, it will expose different endpoints so that you can then move across different pages within your application. First things first, we're gonna remove this favicon because soon enough, we're gonna use our custom one and we'll start tidying up some things. First of all, I'm gonna create two new folders and both of them will be wrapped within parentheses, auth, and we're gonna also include root like this. Now, why did they use parentheses right here? Well, I just used a Next.js concept known as route groups. In the app directory, nested folders are normally mapped to URL paths. However, you can mark a folder as a route group 
to prevent the folder from being included in the routes URL path. What this allows you to do is organize your route segments and project files into logical groups without affecting the URL path structure. So it's useful for organization and for nested layouts, both of which I'll teach you in this application. And you can see right here that the convention is to simply wrap a folder's name into parentheses. So in this example, they tell you that you can organize your routes by marketing, shop, and so on. And then each one of these route groups can have additional pages and it can also have additional layouts, which will be very important later on within our application. So going back within our app, within auth, we can now safely put the sign in folder as well as a sign up folder. Now we have logically divided sign in and sign up from the rest of our pages. For now, let's close that and let's focus on the root, which is basically our entire application. Within the root, we can create a special file called layout.tsx, which will allow us to do some specific things to all of the pages within this route group. What do I mean by that? Well, let me show you. If I run refce right here, that will allow me to quickly spin up a React functional component and we can call it root layout. Now, if this refce didn't work for you, that must mean that you don't have the ES7 plus Redux React Native React snippets installed. So install it, try running refce and it should work. What we can do here is wrap everything as a main component. And then here we can return the children. So we can say children, which means that this component will wrap all of the other pages within it. And children, of course, comes from React props. So we can say children. And considering that we're using TypeScript, we can define the children type as React node coming from React. And now to explain what I mean by creating different layouts, if I now create a navbar here, and I also create something like a footer here, it should be present within all of the pages within the root folder. In our case, within root, we'll also create a new route group called home, where we'll put all of the home routes. But for now, let's just create a new page.tsx within it. Within this page, within the home, we can run RAFCE and create a home component. And next to the home, we can also create a new page called meeting. Within this meeting, we'll create another folder starting with square brackets. This time it's going to be ID like so. And then only within this ID, we'll create a new page.tsx where we can once again run RAFCE and call this page meeting. So let's go over this in a bit more detail and explain what's happening here. We already know about route groups, right? But in this case, we have also used another concept called dynamic routes. So back into the docs here, they say that when you don't know the exact segment names ahead of time and want to create routes from dynamic data, such as different meeting rooms with different IDs, you can use dynamic segments that are filled at the request time or pre-rendered at build time. And the convention here is to simply wrap it in square brackets, for example, ID or slug, which is exactly what we're doing here. So here's an example for a blog, you could use a slug or an ID and then say my post and then render the blog post URL. But an even more important takeaway here is that you can extract that dynamic parameter through the params object. So let's copy what they have here. And I hope you're following these documentation pages with me while you're following this video as well, as that's very, very important. I don't want you to just follow along with the video and replicate what I do. I want you to go ahead and explore even further within the docs until you fully understand each concept that I'm covering. So how do you get to specific pages? Well, you mostly just Google Next.js and then the title of the doc page, in this case, dynamic routes. So let's copy this part. And back in our meeting, 
we can now paste this here. And instead of params slug, this name right here will be equal to whatever you use as the file name or the folder name. In this case, we use the ID. So I'm going to say ID. And now what we can say meeting room, and we can say number, and then you can render the ID. That's going to be params.id. There we go. Finally, let's go back to our app. Here on our localhost 3000, we still have just the button that says click me. But if we now go to a meeting room, specifically a room with a particular number or an ID coming after it, like one, two, three, and press enter, you can see the navbar and the footer because that's coming from the layout that's wrapping our page. And then you can see the meeting room number one, two, three. That means that we're successfully fetching the params. And with that, I hope all of this routing layouts and dynamic route groups make a bit more sense. If they don't make sense right now, they're going to make sense as we keep adding more routes. Once you learn it once, it'll be easy to replicate it for all of the other pages. And talking about fully understanding Next.js, I can't not mention the ultimate Next.js course that we worked over a year on. Right now, it's the best Next.js course out there. So if you want to learn some of the Next.js concepts deeper, understand how all of the biggest companies use Next.js and not just use it as good old React to get stats like this, rather learn how to properly use Next 14 and get perfect stats with deep dives to understand how Next.js truly work behind the scenes to build and deploying a most complex app out there, and then even to active lessons that allow you to replicate what's being taught in the course with examples, resources, hints, and even more. I just had to quickly mention it as if you're watching this video, you most likely will be interested in the course content as well. But with that said, let's continue with developing our Zoom clone. Now that we have our meeting room and our homepage, we're going to create a space for our navbar and sidebar. And they're not going to be right here within this layout, as we don't want to show the navbar and the footer within our meeting page. Rather, we want to show it only within home pages. What do I mean by that? Well, check out our final application. On the home page, you can see the sidebar and the navbar. But as soon as I jump into the meeting, you can see that the sidebar and the navbar are completely gone, allowing us to focus on what matters the most, which is displaying our own camera, as well as the cameras of all of the other users. So to achieve that, we'll have to create a new layout within our home route group by calling it a layout.tsx. To get started with this one, we can basically duplicate what we have in our root layout and paste it here. We're going to rename this one to home layout, and we're going to give this main a class name equal to relative. And now we can show the navbar right here on top of our children. We're going to also create an additional layout, including a div that will have a class name equal to flex. Right within that div with a flex, we'll create a sidebar component. Below it, we'll create a section. That section will have a class name equal to flex min dash h dash screen, which will give it a full height flex dash one. So it expands nicely flex dash call. So the elements appear one below another padding X of six for horizontal padding, padding bottom of six for padding bottom and padding top of 28 to give us some space on top on max MD devices. That means you can see it right here. Media, not all and min width of 768. That means whatever class we give after max MD, it will appear only if the device width is greater than 768 pixels, which is mostly tablet and laptop devices. And here we can give it a padding bottom of 14, a bit smaller. And on small devices, we can give it a padding X of 14. Once again, a bit bigger this time than the previous one. And this tailwind intelligence is pretty cool. So if you hover over it, you get the exact CSS properties we're applying. 
So if that's not working for you, head over to extensions and search for Tailwind CSS IntelliSense. It should be the first one right here, install it, and then you should be able to see exact CSS classes. Within this section, let's also create a div with a class name equal to, that's gonna be w full for full width. And now we can move over the children within this div right here. There we go. So now we're creating the layout for our homepage. If we go back to our app in progress and navigate over to localhost 3000, of course, we don't wanna show the button here. So we have to head back over to this page and actually delete it because this will not be the primary page of our application. So now if you head back, you can see navbar, sidebar, and home. Before we go ahead and add our navbar and sidebar components, let's navigate over to app layout. This is the primary layout that we have right here. And let's just apply an additional class name to our set of classes attached to the body. That's gonna be enter class name, of course. And then we can also append a BG dark of two like this. Now this BG dark of two, if you hover over it, we don't see anything. And if you go back to the app, we don't see a dark background. So how does this work? Well, let's navigate over to our Tailwind config TS. I told you we'll be using this a bit later on. And what we can do is we can extend the theme. Specifically, we can extend the colors by adding a new dark color. Let's see, yeah, we don't have it right now. So we can go extend colors, and then right here, we can say dark, and then create an object for all of the dark colors we have, and then give them some names, like one. This is our first dark color. It will be hash 1C, 1F2E. And we have created our first dark color. Now you might wonder, where did I get this color code from? Well, for that, we're gonna use this phenomenal Figma design page that our JSM designer has designed specifically for you and for this video. So if you haven't already, go to the description and get access to this Figma page as we'll be using it a lot throughout this video and then head over to the second page, which is design. As you can see here, we have everything from the auth page moving over to our home page. So now if you click on the home, you can try the dev mode and you can see a specific color right here. And if you click on different elements, you'll be able to see different colors which we wanna use. In this case, we're interested just in the background color, which I do believe is this one, so we can simply copy it. Going back, we can say something like two, and then define the color we just copied. In this case, it will be this one right here. And it's gonna look something like this. So for now, let's say that we just need these two. Now that we have this dark two, we can actually use it by saying BG dark two. And if you hover over it, you can see the exact background color we added. Although yes, it's applying a bit of opacity, but that's basically the color that we chose and added it to our Tailwind config so that in the future, whenever you wanna use this specific hexadecimal color, you don't have to say 161925, we can just say BG dark two. With that in mind, if we go back to our app, you can see that we have complete darkness. Don't worry, the app didn't break. It's just that the text is also dark, so we cannot see it on the dark background. But this is much better for our eyes rather than switching from light screen to dark screen every time. With that in mind, we can now turn the navbar and sidebar into complete components. So let's navigate over to our components folder and let's create a new file called navbar.tsx, inside of which we can run refce, and let's also create another one called sidebar.tsx, and let's run refce as well. Moving back over to the layout, we can just turn these into self-calling and self-closing components, and of course, you can press control space to get this automatic import layout, and auto import it from components navbar 
and components sidebar. That should look something like this. Now, we're not gonna touch the navbar for now, as what matters the most is the sidebar. So let's navigate over to the sidebar by holding our command or control key and then pressing with your mouse. And why sidebar matters the most is because within it, we'll do all of the routing to all the different pages, such as upcoming, previous, recordings, and creating a personal room. So let's start creating our sidebar by turning it into a section and giving it a class name equal to sticky, which means that it will give it a position of sticky, so it stays there. Left zero, so it's positioned to the left, so it's coming all the way from the top. It will be a flex container. It will have an H screen, which means full height, and W dash fit, so it fits the content. We'll also give it a flex dash call, so the elements appear one below another, as well as the justify between, so that we have some stuff at the top, and then later on we have some stuff at the bottom. After justify between, we'll apply a BG dark one background, so a bit of a different background than the entire homepage, a padding of six to give it some space, padding top of 28, text dash white, so we can actually see the text, and now on max SM devices, which means devices with a min width of 640, we're gonna hide it. So if it's below 640 pixels, we're gonna completely hide it. Else, on large devices, we can expand its W, its width, to about 264 pixels. I found that value to work the best. Then, within this section, we're gonna have a div. That div will have a class name equal to flex, flex dash one, flex dash call, so the elements appear one on top of another, and a gap of six to create some spacing between the elements. And here, we can map over a couple of our items. That'll be things like the homepage, the upcoming meetings, previous meetings, and more. So let's create an array of links. What we could do is create an array here, like this, and then create an object for each route that will have something like image URL for the icon of that route, and that could point to something like icons home.svg. We could also do a route that's gonna be a forward slash and then a label, which is gonna be a home. And then we could do this a couple more times, map over it, but I think you can already see where this would end up. We don't wanna clutter our JSX with some data. So instead of doing this array here, we wanna create this array from scratch. So let's navigate over to our root, and then right here, let's create a new folder called constants. Within constants, let's create an index.ts file, and here we can create that array. Const sidebar links is equal to an array where we have an object that has the image URL of something like forward slash icons forward slash something dot SVG. It also has the route of forward slash, and it also has a label of home. Okay, we can put the label on top maybe so that it makes more sense that we have this, we have the route, and then we have the icon URL for that thing. Now we can duplicate this four more times, one, two, three, four, and the second route will point to the upcoming meetings. So it's gonna be forward slash upcoming, and it's gonna say icons upcoming dot SVG. The first one is of course home, Let's use it with a capital H right here. Then after that, we have previous meetings. So that's previous, forward slash previous, and also icons previous dot SVG. Then we have recordings. Route is gonna point to recordings, and it's gonna be icons video dot SVG with a capital V, more on that soon. And also we're gonna have the last one, which is a personal meeting room. So we can call it personal room, pointing to forward slash personal dash room. And it's gonna be icons add 
dash personal dot SVG. So now we have this array, which we can export. And we can use it right here by saying sidebar links, automatically importing it from constants, which you can see it came right here at the top. And we can then map over it by saying dot map, where we get each individual link. And then for each one of these links, we want to open up a function block. Within this block, we want to check if this link is currently active. And we can do that by saying const is active is equal to, and here we need to tap into the Next.js functionality of figuring out on which path are we currently on. And for that, we'll say const path name is equal to use path name coming from next navigation. And then we can say if path name is triple equal to link dot route, or if path name dot starts with, and here we can again put the link dot route. So what we're doing here is checking whether the path name is currently active. So if we're on the home page, we want to make it blue. If we're on upcoming, we want to make it upcoming and you get the gist. We also need this starts with because sometimes it's not going to be the exact path, like something like meeting one to three, right? In which case we only are checking whether it starts with that link. Now that we have this information, whether it's active or not, we can return a link for each one of these. And this link will be imported from next link. It has to have an href, meaning where is it going to? And we can conveniently use our link dot route right here, as we have already stored it within our sidebar links. So we know exactly where we want to point to. We can also give it a key as we're mapping over it as link dot label as they're all unique. And we can give it a class name. In this case, it's going to be an object where we can use the CN function coming from libutils. This CN is short for class names, and it allows us to add multiple and dynamic class names. For example, we can add the typical class name of flex gap of four between the elements items dash center padding of four. So we can give each element a bit of space rounded dash LG and justify dash start. But now we can also add a second parameter, which is an object adding additional dynamic class names, such as BG blue one like this. And it will only trigger if is active is set to true. This is how we're modifying the styles of each one of these routes. For now, within this link, let's simply render the link dot label. Now, if we go back to our local host, you'll see that the use path name, which is a hook, only works in client components. Add the use client directive at the top of the file to use it. So going back right here at the top, we can add something known as a use client directive. And if we go back, it works. If you head over to client components documentation page, it'll say that client components allow you to write interactive UI that is pre rendered on the server, but it can use client JavaScript to run it in the browser. Of course, you get the interactivity and the browser APIs. Now we want to add this use client to declare that a function is client side rendered because in new Next.js, all of the components by default and pages are server side rendered. So if you want to use hooks, which is one of the most common use cases for client components, you'll want to add this use client directive at the top, or whenever you want to add some interactivity, such as in our case, we added it to be able to navigate to different pages and routes. This is definitely a browser related event. So we need to make it use client server components with all different types of rendering and their differences from client side components and much more is covered in a lot of detail within our ultimate Next.js course. Because if you make all of the components as client side, the application can often be very slow. But in some cases, you have to keep them client side to still preserve that interactivity. Of course, learning when to use which 
will take some time getting used to and is definitely something we talk a lot about within our course. But for now, what you need to know is that a good rule of thumb is that you can keep the components server side all the way until you actually start adding some interactivity to them, such as hooks or browser interactivity, which is when you're gonna get an error and then you can convert them into use client components. With that in mind, back inside of here, we now have something that looks like an actual sidebar. Let's also focus on adding icons to each route, which we can do by taking a look at our public folder and completely deleting it. Because for the purposes of this course, I went ahead and collected all of the icons and images we're gonna use and put them in a zipped folder for you. So simply go to the description, download it, unzip it, and then paste it right here within the root of our application. This new public folder will contain icons and images, some of which will be our avatars as well as our hero background. And then we have a lot of SVG icons. So with that in mind, now that we have this public folder, we can add some more content to show alongside the label. Specifically, that will be a Next.js self-closing image tag, which we can import from Next Image. We can give it a source of link dot image URL. I'll tag of link dot label, a width of about 24, a height of about 24 as well. And then below it, we can display a P tag that will render the link dot label. Of course, we can style it a bit by giving it a class name equal to text-lg, font-semi-bold, and on max large devices, we can simply hide it. This is mostly for mobile devices that have the width less than 1000. So if you go back to the app, we now have something that looks and feels great. But if you try going to upcoming, you can see that it breaks we get a 404. So now that we have the sidebar that acts as a router, what do you say that we go ahead and add all of the necessary routes? And as Next.js uses the file-based routing concept, we can just add them as new files and folders within our app, root, home, and here we can create a couple of new folders. First is upcoming, that will have its own page.tsx, which will also say something like upcoming. Next, we're gonna create a new folder called previous that will also have its own new page.tsx where we can run RAFCE and call it previous. After that, we're gonna do a new one that's gonna say something like recordings and we can also create a new page.tsx where we can run RAFCE that will say recordings then we can create the last one, which will be personal-room, which will also have its own page.tsx, where we can run RAFCE, and we can call it personal-room. There we go. So now we have four different pages, as you can see right here, and that's more or less it. This is the only thing we needed to do to implement routing. So if we go back, click Home, you'll be able to see that we are on the home page, although this text right here is not that visible, so we might wanna fix that. So let's go to this home page and let's turn it into a section. This section will have a class name equal to flex size dash full, so it takes 100% width and 100% height, flex dash call, so we show some elements below, gap of 10, and a text off white so we can actually see what we're doing. Within it, we can render an H1 that will have a class name equal to text-3XL to make it very big, as well as font-bold to make it bolded. And it can say something like, let's do home. And below we can have some kind of content. So let's go ahead and copy this entire section we have here and let's also use it for all of the other pages. Let's start with personal room, override what we have here, and instead of home, simply say personal room. Let's go to previous as well, override the div, 
and say previous. Let's also go to recordings, modify it right here and say recordings. And finally, upcoming. Let's paste it, modify the home to say upcoming. Now, if we collapse them and go back, you can see home spelled out nicely right here. And if we navigate over to upcoming, we can see a large upcoming. If it doesn't look like this for you, maybe reload, then it should take all of these new styles. We have previous, recordings, and personal room. And just like that, without installing any additional external packages for routing, like we have to do for React, like React Router, it works right out of the box with file-based routing, which is just one of many reasons why I fell in love with Next.js and why it's not going anywhere and many more businesses are just starting to use it. With that in mind, let's see why our home is not highlighted as the active element. We are on the home after all, but just looking at the sidebar, we don't know which link is currently active. So going back to the sidebar, once again, using that command P, grow that into your habit because it's much easier to move across files with command P rather than opening all of the files and folders manually. Here, we wanna see why this is active is not getting triggered. I think I see the reason why it's not active. Well, our variable should work correctly. It should say true for homepage, but as you can see, it's applying a property of BG blue one, which we didn't yet add to our Tailwind config. So let's navigate over to the config and let's add a second set of colors with the name of blue and we're gonna do one and back in our zoom clone, we can double click a few times to get to the exact color which we wanna use. Going back, we can simply paste it as a string. Now you can see Tailwind automatically picked up our variable right here. And if you reload, home sweet home, here we are. Now the top of our application is looking a bit blank right now. So what do you say that we go ahead and implement the navbar. To do that, we can just navigate over to the navbar component and start working on it. And now might be a good time to put our editor side by side by our browser so that we can see the changes that we make live. There we go, that's much better. But you can also see that now our sidebar is hidden. So we'll have to figure out how to show all of those links and routes on mobile devices as well. So starting with the navbar, we can turn it into an HTML5 semantic nav tag, and we can give it a class name. It can have a flex between property because we wanna show some things on the left and some things on the right. It'll be fixed to the top with a Z index of 50 so that it appears above other elements. It will have a W of full for full width, a BG dark one, same as the sidebar, padding X of six, padding Y of four, and on large devices, padding X of 10. Now it's hard to see as those colors are very similar, but it is there. Now, right within our nav, we're gonna use a link coming from next link so we can auto import it. We can give it an href of forward slash, so it points to home with a class name equal to flex items dash center and a gap of one. Right within that link, we wanna render a Next.js self-closing image which we can import from next image. And we can give it a source of forward slash icons forward slash logo dot SVG. We also need to give it a width of 32 and height to 32. Now it will no longer complain. And we can also give it an alt tag of something like Zoom logo, that's our version of Zoom, with a class name of max-sm size of 10. So we're modifying the size on different devices. Right below that image, we're gonna do a P tag that will simply say Zoom. So this is again, our version of Zoom. And we're gonna give it a class name equal to text dash inside of square brackets. Now, why do we do square brackets? Well, in Tailwind CSS, you do square brackets whenever you wanna apply specific values. 
So in this case, I wanna apply something like 26 pixels and that's how we do it. We can also make it font something like extra bold, text dash white, and on max SM devices, it can be hidden. There we go. So this is too small to show the logo because we'll show some more stuff later on. But if we expand it, you can see it. And also on this tablet layout, you can see that we don't show the text, we only show the icons. So now let's go back to mobile and let's implement the mobile nav. Mobile nav will look something like this. We have the logo, we have the clerk user management right here, and then we have all of the links nicely animating from the left. So to do that, below the link, we can display a div with a class name equal to flex between and a gap of five. Here, later on, we'll implement our clerk user management. So I'm gonna add a comment for that clerk user management. But for now, we wanna go below it and we wanna show a new component called mobile nav. So let's create it by going to components and creating a new file called mobile nav.tsx where we can run RAFCE and call it a mobile nav. Go back and render it as a self-closing component, which is imported from that slash mobile nav. And with that in mind, we can now navigate over to mobile nav and implement the navbar for mobile devices. Of course, I mean the entire mobile sidebar that jumps out from the left. So to get started, let's wrap everything into a section that will have a class name equal to w full max w 264 pixels. So this is the width we want the mobile nav to have. Right within, we wanna use our first ShadCN component of the day. And once again, I wanna teach you how to truly build apps on your own. So we're gonna to refer to the documentations as every great developer should. I headed over to ShadCN UI. I'm gonna press Command K, which in most modern developer applications opens up this search bar. Here, you can search for what you're after. In this case, we're gonna use a sheet component. Sheet is a dialog that expands. So if we click open, this is how it looks like. Let's go ahead and install it by copying this command and pasting it within our new terminal that we get after we split it and press enter. Next, let's copy its usage. So here we can copy just the imports. Let's paste them at the top. And then we can also copy this sheet right here and paste it right within our section. Of course, let's also properly indent it. And then here you have a couple of examples. It can come from top, bottom, left, right. You can modify the size and more. That's what I'm gonna teach you. But it's important that you know your way around using the components from ShadCN or any other external package. So back into the home, we cannot see much happening right here, but don't worry, we will soon. First, we have this sheet trigger, which won't just say open, rather it will render an image coming from next image. And this image will have a source equal to forward slash icons forward slash hamburger dot SVG. It will also have a width of about 36 and a height of 36 as well. So if we save it, you can now see it appear right here. And then it opens up this sheet that we have copied over from ShadCN. Let's also give it an alt tag of hamburger icon and a class name of cursor dash pointer. So people know it's clickable and on small devices, we're gonna hide it. Also, this sheet trigger will appear as child. So that means that it's a child of a sheet component. Now, currently we can see it below this icon. Later on, we'll move it to the right side, but for now we can leave it here as we'll still have a lot of work to do to make this sheet look a bit closer to our overall design. So let's focus on the sheet content by giving it a side equal to left, a class name equal to border dash none and a BG dark off one. 
Now, in this case, we won't be needing the sheet header, title, description, and all that stuff. So we can simply remove it. And instead of that, we can render a link. This link will be the same as the link that we used before. So we can head over to our nav bar to simply use it. That's going to be nav bar. And here we have a link that says Yum. So let's copy this entire link and paste it right here within our sheet content. Of course, let's properly indent it. And let's also import link coming from next link. If we now save this, and if you click the sheet, you can now see the Yum appear right there. In this case, we don't have to hide it because we are within the sheet. So we're going to show Yum right there. And now we can go below the link to show all of the other links by wrapping everything in a div and giving it a class name equal to flex. Now we have to be careful here. We have to give it a full height, but we have to deduct it by the height of the nav bar. So we can use a cool tailing property called H dash, and then we can open square brackets and say calc. So we can do calculations, 100 VH, which is full height minus 72 pixels. That looks something like this, no spaces. We can also make it flex dash call. So the links appear one below another and justify dash between as well as overflow dash Y dash auto. So we don't have a scroll bar. Now within this div, we can also render something known as a sheet close, which is a component we have to import from components UI sheet. It will also appear as a child and it will have its own section right here. This section will have a class name equal to flex H dash full for full height flex dash call gap of six between the elements padding top of 16 and text dash white. Finally, within here, we can map over all of our links. The sheet close simply means that whatever we click here, it will close the sidebar. So let's head over to our typical sidebar and we can copy this entire part where we map over the sidebar links. That was supposed to be flex one. So with that done, let's now copy the sidebar links all the way to the bottom here and paste it within this section. And of course, let's not forget to properly indent it by going all the way here and indenting it. Yeah, I think that's looking good. We can import the same sidebar links from constants, which is another benefit of doing it this way. And we also need to get the path name to know which one is active. So at the top, we can say const, we can say const path name is equal to use path name coming from next navigation. And of course, as it's a hook, we have to add the use client directive to this component. And we can remove all of these components we're not using from components UI sheet and nicely put it in one line like this. Also, we have to import CN right here as we have multiple class names coming from lib utils. With that, if you open it, we have something that looks like this. There is slight modifications, which we'll have to still do. First things first, we have our link that has flex rounded LG, but in this case, we don't need justify start rather we need a W full. So it takes the full width as well as a max dash W dash 60. And we're also applying the same property. If it's active, we can decrease the icon size a bit to 20 here. And then we render a P tag that doesn't have to have font LG or max hidden. It can simply have font dash semi bold. There we go. That's much better. Now, if we click on one of these, it doesn't close. So what we have to do is we have to wrap each one of these links in a new sheet close like this. And we're going to also give it as child. And we have to give it a key of link that route since we're mapping over it. So now simply copy the ending tag of sheet close and put it at the end of the link. And of course, indent the link properly. So it fits right here and save it. 
Now, if you click on a specific link, it should nicely close the sidebar so you can then see the content which you clicked on. Great, we're almost there with the sidebar. But first you can notice a mistake we have, and that is that both the home as well as another page are currently active. And we don't want that. So for that reason, within our mobile nav, we can just remove the second part of the equation here and just say if path name is triple equal to link that route. And that will make it home, upcoming, previous, and so on. So this now works. Also, Shatsian made this component very nice. You can just exit out of it. You can click outside to exit it, or we can navigate by simply clicking the link. Here, you might have noticed something weird, and that is that we're using a flex between property without first declaring this as a flex container. Also, here. And if you hover over it, it's not gonna give you styles like it does in other properties. So this must mean that this is a faulty CSS property. But not all CSS class names have to come from Tailwind. You can also add your own classes to make your life a bit easier. So if we head over to app, globals.css, here you can find some class names that Tailwind added for you. But on top of those classes, you can also add something else. Add layer utilities. And then here you can define utility classes to make your life easier, such as dot flex center. And here you apply a couple of tailwind properties. We're gonna apply a flex, a justify center, and items dash center. And same things here, dot flex between. Here we're gonna apply flex, justify between, and items dash center. So you get three class names for the price of one. And as soon as you do that, you'll notice that now Tailwind reads this, or not Tailwind, but rather our own CSS, and knows to properly position this. So now we have it at the end, it nicely opens up and closes. That means that now our mobile nav is good and we can actually navigate and we can get back to desktop and see this in its full glory. Of course, it'll be better if we only have one active link. So going back to our sidebar, we can slightly modify our is active property by saying starts with open a template string and then say link that route and then add a forward slash. So we wanna ensure it has the forward slash as well as then it's not gonna be just the home. So now if you save this, you can see it's just upcoming, previous recordings and more and home. So what we have now is a beautiful, modern and simplistic Next.js starter code where we have implemented routing as well as the initial design. Next, I'm gonna show you how easy it is to add auth to your app. And it won't be only auth you'll use Clerk's UI components to manage your users. Now, I know you're cautious about using third-party tools, especially for something as important as auth, but thankfully Clerk is completely free for 10,000 monthly active users. It's not just 10,000 users, it's 10,000 monthly active users. So let's read a bit more about the pricing. It cannot be that good, can it? Well, if we go here, you can notice that for the free plan, there is no credit card required, 10,000 monthly active users, all of the pre-built components, and even a custom domain, which is not something you see often with free plans. And let's be honest, our app won't yet pass 10,000 monthly active users. So there's a high probability you will never have to pay for it at all. And if your app does go viral and you really need to scale to hundreds of thousands of users, you would need to pay only two cents per user after the 10,000th user. But the fact that it's free is not the only reason we'll be using Clerk. Clerk integrates the Next.js applications incredibly well. You get magic links, social sign-in, multi-factor authentication, and even more literally within minutes. And this is something that would take you weeks to implement on your own. So let's explore the docs. Here, we can follow the Next.js quick start. 
I can see that the next major version is coming soon, so I'm gonna use it immediately, and you can use it with me, but there's also a high probability that you're watching this video later on and that the version 2 is out of the beta. In any case, you should be able to follow along just fine. So the first step is to install Clark Next.js. Let's copy the command and paste it right here. Next, we have to set up our environment keys. We can create a new .env.local file and then add our environment variables. So let's copy it, head to the root of our folder and add a new file called .env.local and simply paste it right here. Next, we have to add clerk provider to our app. So let's do just that. Going back to our outer layout, which is just within the app, so that is this one right here, we want to wrap our body with clerk provider coming from clerk next.js. So we can just do this, put the body within it, and indent it properly. Next, we have to add middleware to our application. So let's create a new middleware.ts file and put it inside the root directory alongside the .env.local. Let's copy it and create a new file called middleware.ts and we can paste it. In this middleware, we can define our public routes by saying export default clerk middleware. Later on, we'll be able to modify our clerk middleware to make some routes public and others private. Next, let's create a header with a clerk component. Here, we can use just this signed in to show the user button, and we're gonna use it within our navbar. So let's head over to navbar, and let's render it right here where it says clerk user management. We show the signed in, and we show the user button. Signed in is coming from clerk next.js and user button is coming from clerk next.js as well. Finally, we need to add a homepage, which we already have, and that's more or less it. So let's sign into our clerk account so that we can fill out our environment variables because without them, the app will say publishable key is not valid. So to ensure your app is fully working, and that you can follow the process exactly the same way that I do and that you see the same things that I do, click the clerk link in the description, navigate over to get started, and then either create your account or sign in. Once you're in, you can create a new application and you can choose your sign in options. We're gonna keep email, let's do Google, maybe LinkedIn, and let's also add GitHub. This is looking good. So let's add the application name of JSM underscore zoom underscore clone and let's click create application and now we can copy our own customized environment variables and paste them right here and while we're in the dashboard we can also expand user and authentication go under email phone and username and turn the username on so we can uniquely identify all of our users with that in mind, back in our code, we can now see a user button if we're logged in. But if we're not, we have to find a way to log the user in. We can either do that by creating a signed out button. So if we're signed out, then sign us in using the sign in button. But we won't do it on click. Rather, what we will do is we will set all of the routes to private. So whenever you come to any route, like localhost 3000 or a meeting or anything, we're gonna automatically redirect the user to log in as our app requires authentication to work. So to make that happen, we can navigate over to middleware.ts. Here, we can import a new thing from clerk next.js server, which is called create route matcher. This will allow us to match specific routes, which we wanna make public, or private. So let's declare our protected routes by saying const protected routes is equal to create route matcher, which we call and then pass an array of different routes. First one is just the forward slash. We definitely wanna protect that. We also have all of the other routes we have created so far, such as the upcoming. Let's do a bit more for previous after that, we have recordings, 
Finally, we have the personal room. And the last one is forward slash meeting. And then in parentheses, you can say dot asterisk, which is going to match all of the meeting routes. And then you can create a callback function within the clerk middleware inside of which you get access to two different parameters, auth and the request. Here, you can check if we are on a protected route. So if protected routes to which you pass the request to know whether the current request is going to the protected routes. And then if it is a protected route, then you call the auth and then you call the dot protect on it. That's it. That's the only thing you have to do. No more going to the nav bar and then checking here whether you have access to the user and whether that user can see the page. Everything is done right here. You can notice that we are automatically redirected to our authentication page. Now, currently, this auth page has this weird URL, improved javelin 31. What we want to do is get a bit more control over the URL as well as the customization of the page. After all, we know how our auth page should look like based off of this Figma design. It should look something like this. So going back to our code, we can go to our .env.local and here, clerk allows us to add two new variables. Next, underscore public, underscore clerk, underscore sign, underscore in, underscore URL. This is the link to which we want to navigate for our sign in. And that's just going to be forward slash sign dash in. We want to duplicate this and modify it for the sign up. And of course, this will simply say sign up. Now, if we save that, our environment variables should reload automatically. And if we go back and re-navigate to localhost 3000, you can see that now we are redirected to our own localhost 3000 forward slash sign in but currently that page doesn't exist. So let's create it. Back in our code, we can close all of the currently open files and we can navigate over to app auth sign in. Then within here, we can create a new folder with a bit of a weird name. It will have a double square bracket dot 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 sign in and then you close the double square bracket. This ensures that it catches all of the sign in redirects and that we always end up on the correct page. So now you can create a new file within it called page.tsx. Within this page, you can run RAFCE and you can call it sign in page. Make sure not to just call it sign in because what we wrap within the main component right here is exactly that a self-closing sign-in component coming from clerk Next.js. So basically the only thing you have to do is import sign-in from clerk and put it within the sign-in page. And now if you reload, you'll be able to see our own dark background on our own URL. Let's center it by giving it a class name equal to flex h screen for full height, w full for full width, items dash center and justify dash center too. Now we have a beautiful looking sign in right within our own domain. Let's also do the same thing for the sign up by copying all of this code and then creating a new folder with the same naming convention, double square bracket, dot, 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 sign up. And then you also close dot double bracket and you create a new page dot TSX right within it. Within here, you can paste what we copied and replace the sign in to sign up, make sure to call it, and then also replace sign in page to sign up page. Now, if you navigate over to sign up, you'll have a create your account auth page where you can navigate to sign in and vice versa. This is beautiful. And of course, if you wanna apply further customizations, you can. The only thing you have to do is inspect the source, try to find an element you want to modify, such as this entire background, and then you can change the color. For example, background to something like black. And there we go. It changes instantly. And you can also target specific text elements to make them white. The CSS classes that change some of the default behaviors 
are typically called overrides. So while I was first developing this project, I took some time to target a few elements and show you how we can override them. So in the readme down below, you can find a complete globals.css files that contains a few of these overrides. So simply copy it and paste it here. If you scroll a bit up, you'll notice that all the way at line 56, we have a few of these clerk overrides where we target a specific class name like CL logo box. We modify the height, the background, mostly changing the colors of text to white and colors of backgrounds to a bit of a darker color. And also we have a few overrides for stream components, which we'll be using later on. With that in mind, if we now go back, not a lot of things change just yet. That's because these are only some small overrides that we applied, but clerk has their own official way of customizing all of clerk components. And you do it right here directly within the clerk provider. The only thing you have to do is access the appearance object and then provide the customizations you want to apply, such as variables. And here you can choose an object and choose the color of the text. So color text, we want to make that hash FFF, which is the white color. So now you can see that all of the text changed to white. I also collapse this so that it's easier to see what's happening. Also, we're going to change the color primary to a color of hash zero E seven, eight F nine. There we go. So that's the color of our button. We can also change the color of the background. That will be our black color hash one C one F two E. There we go. That's more like it. We also have the color input background which will be hash 252A41. Okay, that's more like it. And then finally, we have a color input text, which will be once again, hash FFF, which is the white color. Now, some of the additional customizations we can apply is the fact that we can add our own logo. So here we can say layout, and then we can define the logo image URL, which will be forward slash icons, forward slash yum dash logo dot SVG. And just like that, it appears right at the top. We can also add social buttons variant. And we're going to make it an icon button. Now this matches the look and feel of our application much better than before. So let's expand it one final time to full view. Currently, everything looks good besides this GitHub logo right here, which is dark. So if we inspect it and select it, you can see that we have this image right here. That's the CL provider icon GitHub. Maybe if we select it and try to apply a filter of invert of one, it will work and it does. It changes the color from black to white. Some CSS magic for you. So we need to copy the class CL provider icon GitHub like this. Go back to our code to globals.css. Find our clerk overrides. There we go. And we can apply this property dot CL provider icon GitHub. And then you can simply say filter is invert of one. Again, no special magic here, just CSS. And I'm happy that this happened. So I can show you exactly how you would go ahead and change any part of this clerk checkout by yourself. It's completely customizable. So going back right here, we have such a beautiful checkout that matches the rest of our design. So let's go ahead and sign up for the first time to our application. As you can see, you have a regular username, email, and password authentication with complete error handling, or we can use Google. After you sign up using Google, it will ask you to choose a username. In this case, I'll choose JS Mastery and click continue. And just like that, we are redirected to our localhost 3000, which is our homepage. And on top right, we have a beautiful user profile icon where you can manage your account. 
You can update your profile, your username, add multiple email addresses, and even more connected accounts. And all of that is integrated and customized so nicely within our application. And now we can focus on transforming our homepage from this to this. And then soon after, start implementing all of the video streaming functionalities like creating a meeting, joining a meeting, scheduling a meeting, and even viewing meeting recordings. So with that in mind, let's start with the UI of our homepage, starting with this nice looking banner that tells you the current time, and then also creating these four home cards. First, I'll collapse my homepage to mobile view, and I'm gonna head over to app root home page. This is our homepage. So to get started, let's remove this H1 that says home and let's wrap everything in a div. This will be a div for our banner. So let's give it a class name that will be equal to H dash something about, let's do 300 pixels like this. We need to give our banner a height, W full for full width, rounded dash 20 pixels. So it has rounded edges and BG dash hero, as well as BG dash cover. Now, again, if you hover over these, you can notice that nothing is happening and that's because they're coming from the tailwind config. So if we go over to tailwind.config.ts and remove all of these things that have been here from the beginning, we don't need any of that all the way up to the keyframes. We can properly close the colors and right below the colors above the keyframes, we can say background image. This will be an object that will contain a hero key and it will be a double quoted string that says URL. And then once again, a single quoted string pointing to forward slash images forward slash hero dash background dot PNG. And then you have to properly close it. Now, if we save this, and reload the page. Now we should have access to this background image. So if we expand it to full view, you can see that we have some notes, meaning that we're preparing for a meeting that is about to be held. Within this div, let's create another div that will have a class name equal to flex h-full for full height, flex-call so that the elements appear one on top of another, justify between, on max MD devices, so these are devices larger than 678 pixels, we wanna give them a padding X of five. Same max MD, we wanna give it a padding Y of eight. And then on large devices, we wanna give it a padding of 11 all across the board. Right within that div, we can create an H2 that will say something like upcoming meeting at and we can say something like 12.30 p.m. For now, this is static. Later on, we can make it dynamic if we want to. Let's style this H2 a bit by giving it a class name equal to glass morphism, like this. That's gonna give it this glassy background. And this is another class that's coming from our globals.css. So if you simply search for it, you'll be able to find it here. It simply applies a background with a backdrop blur. We can also give it a max dash W of about 270 pixels. And we can also give it a rounded padding Y of two for some spacing, text dash center, text dash base, and font dash normal. So this is kind of like a little chip that says when the next meeting is. Now below the H2, still within the div, we can create another div that will have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, gap of two. Right within it, we can create another H1 that will tell the time. And here we can tell the actual time and date. So that's gonna look something like this. Let's do 11.30 a.m. And then below this H1, we can have a P tag that will render the date. So I'm gonna copy the current date and paste it here. Now let's style it properly by giving this H1 a class name equal to text-4xl font-extra-bold 
on large devices text-7XL. So it's going to be even larger. Finally, let's style this P tag by giving it a class name equal to text-LG, so a bit smaller, font-medium, text-sky-1, and on large devices, text-2XL. This sky is a new color, so you know what we have to do. Go back to tailwind config and then add a new color of sky. That's going to be below blue, sky, off, 1, that's going to be C9 DDFF. And we have to add a hash up front. That's going to give it this nice bluish color. Now, the next thing we have to do is figure out how to use JavaScript to get the current date and time and not only get it in the date string, but present it as a human readable string of time and date. This can be a little exercise for you if you want to play with it. So create a new variable called const time. And that's going to be equal to some kind of a string. And you can also do a const date is equal to also some kind of a string right here. Now, instead of using these values, instead of time, we can show the dynamic time. And instead of date, we can show the dynamic date property. Of course, both of which will be gone as they're simply an empty string right now. Now, just to give you a bit of a hint, if you want to do it on your own, we can say const now is equal to new date. And now the way this is going to work is you can play with this now property calling now dot to locale time or date string. For example, let's do time string like this. And that's going to give you some kind of a time. But of course, we don't need seconds in this case, and we also need to get the date. So if you want to pause this video, pause it right now, look into this new date object and try to make it exactly what we want in the final application, which is a date and time that looks something like this. No seconds. And here we have a long date format. Give it a shot and then be right back. If not, I'm going to show you how to do it. So first of all, we can specify which country's time format we want to get. In this case, that's going to be ENUS like this. And then we can also pass an object for additional options, such as our is going to be in a two digit format. And then a minute will also be in a two digit format. That's the only thing we needed to do for the time. Now let's play with the date. It's going to be a bit more complicated, but nothing special. First, we're going to wrap everything in a new parenthesis and say new international. So just ENTL dot date time format, which you call as a function, you pass the EN US, and then you pass additional options of date style which is going to be set to full. If you do this, you're going to see that this is going to return a date object. So now you have to call the dot format now onto that date object, which will give you the current date. And with that, the top part of our homepage has now been implemented and it's looking great. Now let's focus on one of the most important parts of our homepage, which is this bottom part that represents four different cards allowing you to do four different actions within our Zoom clone application. So one thing that I already know is that these things will have to either open up a modal like this, or they will have to do a redirect, both of which are client side actions. So that means that we have to convert this into a client component. So that means that we have to put them within a client component. So we can create one right away by going to the file explorer, components and creating a new component called meeting type list, because this is a list of different meeting types. And we can call that .tsx and run RAFCE. And we don't have to turn it into a use client right now, but based on our previous experience, we can already know it will be a client side component. So that's why we have taken it apart from the page and used it as a new meeting type list component, which we can then refer to right here. So now we have the meeting type list, which is client side rendered, 
but we don't need any client-side functionalities for this, so the entire page still is server-side rendered. I hope that makes just a bit of sense. This will allow us for the page in general, like the sidebar, navbar, and this main clock to load much more quickly than these links. So that will increase performance and improve the overall user experience. And if you remember, that will also give you much better core web vitals going from something like this to this. But as I mentioned before, you cannot always do it, right? We can do it in this case, but for a meeting page, the entire meeting will have to be client side as we'll be using hooks within them. So with that in mind, let's navigate over to the meeting type list and let's start implementing it. We can focus on the JSX first, wrapping everything in a section that has a class name equal to grid. Yep, I don't use grids often, I mostly use flex, but when you literally have something that looks like a grid, like four elements appearing one after another or one below another, you can opt for using grid. We're gonna do a grid that has a grid calls one with a gap of five. And on medium devices, we can do grid calls two and on extra large devices, grid calls four. This is the only thing you have to do to get responsiveness with simple grid like this. Now within here, we can create our card. That's gonna be a div that will have a class name equal to bg-orange-1. And immediately, you know that we have to add this orange to our Tailwind config, which of course we can extract from our Figma. But now that you know how easy it is to create your own Tailwind config, and now that you fully understand how it works, in the description down below, I'll provide you with the rest of the Tailwind config. You can notice that basically everything is the same, the background image and all of the colors, we just added a few more colors. And now it automatically recognizes this BG orange one. While we're creating this box, let's write something in it like box one. And there we go, we can see it. So now let's continue styling it by giving it a PX of four, padding Y of six, flex, flex dash call, justify dash between, W dash full, on extra large devices, max dash W dash 270 pixels, min dash H dash 260 pixels, that's gonna give it height, rounded dash 14 pixels, that's gonna make it a box, round it a bit, and we can give it a cursor dash pointer to make it seem like it's clickable. Great. Now each one of these divs will actually be clickable, so we can add an on-click property, which for now we can leave empty. But later on, we'll do some actions right here. And there we go, you know what I was saying. As soon as you add some interactivity, like on-clicks or event listeners or so on, you have to turn it into a client component. So right at the top, we can say use client, which will make it a client component. Now within this box, instead of simply saying box one, let's render a div, and that div will have a class name equal to flex-center, glass morphism, size of 12, and rounded of 10 pixels. That's this little box within this box, which will render the icon. So we can render the self-closing image tag which we need to import from next image. And it will have a source equal to, let's do icons, add meeting dot SVG. And of course, we also have to give it an alt tag of meeting and a width of about 27 and a height of 27 as well. So now we have this add new meeting. Below this div, we can have one last div that will have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and a gap of two. And right within it, we can have an H1 that will render whatever this box says. So in this case, that will be new meeting. And below it, we can render a P tag that will say start an instant meeting. Great, 
let's style this a bit by giving this H1 a class name equal to text-2xl and font-bold. And let's also style the P tag by giving it a class name equal to text-lg and font-normal. There we go. That's our box. Now, here's a quick lesson for you. We don't need just one box. We need four different boxes with different titles, descriptions, icons, colors, and actions that they do. But still, it's the same box, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this entire div right here with the class name of BG Orange one cut it away and turn it into a new component, which we're going to call home card. So new file home card dot TSX run RAFCE. And then instead of this div paste what we just copied, which is this entire div. And it looks like I have to properly close it. And I have to import image from next image. And it would be good if we properly indented all of this. So I'm going to select all of the lines and just bring it back by one notch. There we go. So now we have this home card, which I can call within the meeting type list home card and call it like this. And here is our card. Now the power of creating a reusable component is that we can now simply reuse it three more times and we get something that looks like this, but that's not necessarily what we want, right? We want to have four different boxes, boxes that are blue, purple, yellow, and that say different things. So a lesson on creating reusable components is that first you have to figure out when you can reuse something. And that's usually when it looks or feels similar, like it has the same layout. And then the second step, is to figure out the things that are different. In this case, that is the color, the title, description, icon, and the action that happens once we click on it, right? So now that we know that, you can pass those as different props. So for example, for the first home card, we're going to pass an image, IMG, of forward slash icons, forward slash add meeting dot SVG, we're going to pass a title of new meeting. We're going to pass a description of start an instant meeting. And we're going to pass the handle click functionality, which will set the state. So let's immediately create a new state field. Use state snippet. That's how I like to create states. It's going to be called meeting state and set meeting state, which will at the start be empty. We have to import use state from react. And what we can do with TypeScript is define the exact types of this state. So it can be three different strings is schedule meeting or is joining meeting or is instant meeting or finally it's undefined at the start. So now we know what this meeting state can be. And on this card home card, we're going to call a callback function that will simply call set meeting state and set it to the first box will be is joining meeting. There we go. Now, of course, if we go back and save this, nothing will happen because even though we're passing these props in, we're not properly accepting them within our home card. So let's just copy this and paste it for all other four home cards as well, like this. There we go. And the last one. And now we can modify the props for each different card. The second one will have not add meeting, but schedule.svg. It will say schedule meeting. And we can say something like plan your meeting for the description. And for the handle click, we can say is schedule meeting. Now a cool thing about the types we provided is if you set something like is scheduling meeting, 
it will automatically tell you that this type does not exist on this set state, which is a pretty cool thing to save you from yourself. Next up, let's focus on the recordings. So this will be the box for recordings.svg. It will say something like view recordings. And the description can be something like check out your recordings. And the handle click will be a bit different for this one, as we don't necessarily want to open up a modal, we want to re-navigate to the recordings page. So for that, we can use the router. So right at the top, we can say const router is equal to use router. And we can import that coming from next navigation. That allows us to very easily say something like this router dot push. And then we can push to forward slash recordings, the page we have already created. And these are our four boxes. And I just noticed that I forgot passing one of the most important things to each one that is also different, which is the color. So we can pass an additional class name equal to let's make it something like BG dash orange dash one for the first one. We can copy this for the second one. We can do BG blue one for the third one. We can do BG purple one. And for the last one, we can do something like BG yellow one. There we go. So now we're passing all of these props, but still nothing is changing. But don't worry about it. Changing will be so easy now for all four of these as we can now navigate into the home card and accept all of these props we're passing. Props like class name, image, title, description, and handle click. Of course, as we're using TypeScript, we have to define these as home card props, which is a new type or an interface. So an interface is basically a type that is extendable we're going to call it home card props. And you basically define of which types are these properties. Class name will be a string. Image will be a string as well. We have a title of a string. Description will also be a string. And finally, the handle click will be a function that returns nothing void. And now we can modify all of our properties. Let's start with the color. We can remove the BG orange one. And instead, we can make this dynamic and make it a CN function coming from libutils, to which we pass all of these existing strings, which looks something like this, if we properly close it. There we go. And then you can pass an additional parameter as we have learned before to this CN function which is the additional class you want to pass. In this case, the class name coming from the props. So now immediately all of them get a different color. Let's continue with what happens once you click on them. Here, we can simply call the handle click because each one now has a different action. Also, we can modify the source of the image by saying source is equal to IMG. There we go. We have a plus, a calendar, a camera, and another plus right here. Oh, I might have missed that one. So at the bottom on the yellow one, it's not add meeting. Rather, it will be join meeting dot SVG. We can say join meeting as the title. And we can add a description via invitation link. And this will set the meeting state to is joining meeting. So now if we save it, we have different icons on all four of these. So going back to the home card, let's also modify the title, which is as easy as simply rendering a dynamic title property and a dynamic description property. You see how easy it is once you pass all of these as props. And that's it. You just got four different completely custom cards. This was a great lesson on when to create reusable components. And with that, if we now expand our homepage, you can see how great it looks like. 
In this case, I will even skip adding these to these upcoming meetings because our home cards nicely fill up the space. So now that we have our home, finally, we can start focusing on what happens once we click on a specific card. And referring to the final application, once we click new meeting, we have a new modal that opens up that says start meeting. So let's do just that by going back home and back in the meeting type list, we can scroll down. Still within the section, we can create our meeting modal. This will be a new component called meeting modal.tsx where we can run RAFCE and we can simply use it right here, meeting modal coming from that slash meeting modal. Back in our existing application, if we scroll down, we can see the modal right now at the bottom, but we don't want it to be at the bottom. We want it to actually appear as a modal. So first things first, let's pass the needed props to it so that the modal knows how it needs to behave, when it needs to open and when it needs to close. First of all, we're going to pass the is open property, which will be true only if the meeting state is triple equal to is instant meeting. Then we can pass the on close property, which will be a callback function where we're going to set the meeting state to undefined. So we're going to reset it. So it closes. We can also pass a title, which will be start an instant meeting, a class name of text dash center. We're going to use this later on a button text. So this is what the button will say, start meeting. And then we can pass a handle click. So what will happen once we click it, where we can call a new function called create meeting, which we have to define right here. Const create meeting is equal to a callback function. So with that in mind, now we're passing all of the necessary props into the meeting model. So let's dive into it. And let's accept all of those props. First, we have the is open. We have the on close, the title, class name. We can also accept children later on. The handle click, button text, image, and the button icon. There's a lot of props for this one. And that's going to be of an interface meeting modal props which we can define right at the top by saying interface meeting modal props where is open will be set to a Boolean on close is a function that doesn't return anything. So void title is of a type string class name is optional and it will be of a type string. Then we have children, which will also be optional of a type react node, which we have to import from react handle click, which will also be optional and it will be a callback function that returns nothing. So void a button text, which will be of a type string and it will also be optional. So sometimes we won't have a button image, which will be optional of a type string and a button icon optional of a type string. Now we have everything we need to start creating our meeting modal. And this meeting modal will be ShadCN's dialog. It is a window overlaid on either the primary window or another dialog window. The way it works is you click a button and then it opens up. So let's go ahead and use it by first installing it by copying the command going to our terminal and pasting it right here. And while it's installing, let's see the usage. We can get a few of these imports and paste them at the top. And immediately after we can copy its usage. So let's scroll down and replace the div with the dialogue and let's indent it properly. Now, if we save it and go back to our working application at the bottom, you'll be able to see the open button, which you can click and it will open up some kind of a dialogue, which doesn't seem to be quite styled. So let's go ahead and fix it and make it look better. This dialogue will have the open property equal to is open 
coming from the props. So now if we click open, it won't work because this is not a dialog trigger. Rather, we'll trigger it by clicking on one of these boxes. So if you remember, the is open we're passing to this meeting modal is if meeting modal is equal to is instant meeting. And we're setting it to is instant meeting if we are right here under new meeting. Oh, I think this right here should have been is instant meeting, not is joining meeting. So now if we click new meeting, it's going to open up. Now let's figure out what we're going to put within it. We also can pass a function to close it on open change. And here we pass the on close. Now within our dialogue content, we don't need anything else for now. So we can only keep the content and we can give it a class name equal to flex w dash full max dash w dash 520 pixels like this. We can also give it a flex dash call. So the elements appear one below another, a gap of six, a border of none, a BG dash dark of one padding X of six padding Y of nine and a text dash white. This is better. So now we have an empty dialogue content. Right within it, we can render a div and that div will have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call and a gap of six. And within it, we can see if we have access to the image. So only image and end. If we have the image, we render a div. We have to close that div as well. And within that div, we will render a self-closing image tag, which we have to import from next image give it a source equal to image, an alt tag of image, a width of 72, and a height of 72 as well. Now for this particular modal, we don't have an image, so we cannot see it. But for some other ones, we might have an image, in which case we'll render it. It's all about making this component reusable. For now, let's give this div a class name of flex and justify dash center. Now below this image, we're always going to have an H1. So let's make it render the title. In this case, it's start an instant meeting. We can also give it a class name equal to, we're going to make it dynamic CN coming from libutils, which is going to render text dash three XL font dash bold and leading dash 42 PX like this. And we can also pass the class names, which we're passing from props. Of course, we have to fix this to say H1. And now it's a big start and instant meeting. Right below this H1, we're going to render children if we have any. And then below the children, we can render a chat CN button, which is going to come from UI button. And it will either render the button text coming from props, or it will say schedule meeting like this to this button, we can pass a class name equal to BG dash blue dash one to make it stand out focus dash visible ring of zero like this. So this is just to fix some default behaviors when clicking buttons. And then we also have focus visible ring dash offset dash zero. There we go. Looks good. Also to this button, we can pass an on click property equal to handle click coming from props. And if we have a button icon, so only if button icon exists, then we can render a new image right here with a source of button icon with an alt tag of button icon, a width of about 13 and a height of about 13 as well. In this case, we don't have it. And if we do, we have to provide some space between the button icon and the button text. So we can do and MBSP and then semicolon. This is an extra space between the two. And this, my friends, is our modal completely done and waiting to accomplish its first action, which is start meeting. That means that we can now go back to meeting type list, check out our modal see it's calling create meeting. 
And now we can focus on this function right here, where for the first time ever, we can create our first meeting room. And that means that we finally came to the part of the project that you clicked on this video for. Implementing your own Zoom clone with video streaming functionalities. And to implement it, we'll use the industry leading tool called Stream. Stream allows us to implement chat, video and audio in days instead of months or even years that would take to develop such a scalable and robust video platform. And I want to take a second here to discuss why we might want to use a third party tool such as stream instead of building this from scratch in house streams, APIs and SDKs are developed by hundreds of developers for multiple years, and they power a lot of huge companies. So sometimes it's not necessarily about learning how to do everything from scratch. It's about learning how to use the existing tools that are at your disposal to accomplish the tasks that your app needs to focus on. In this case, we'll be using their video and audio better release. So let's learn more about it. It's built with developer experience in mind and docs to help you build it. Also, you're following this video, so you know that everything will work perfectly. But let's discuss the elephant in the room, pricing. As clerk, Stream allows you to build using their SDKs and APIs completely for free. You get 200 bucks of free credits, which means 66,000 minutes per participant. What's very important is that there's no credit card required. And you're getting a lot of these features completely for free. It would take us years to develop this on our own. So why not use something that is compliant, has phenomenal uptimes, security and support. It's about learning how to use what is at our disposal. So with that in mind, let me teach you how to develop world class video and audio directly within all of your apps. First, you need to click the stream link down in the description. It will allow you to follow along and see exactly what I'm seeing on the screen and develop it without any issues. Once you're there, head over to developer, video and audio, and then head over to react docs. Next, go to installation. First, we need to install the packages needed for stream video react SDK. Let's install it using npm. Back within our app, we can run npm install at stream io forward slash video dash react dash SDK. Once that's done, we can go to the quick start. The quick start will give us a quick overview of how streams video SDKs work. First, we have to set up the client and calls by creating an instance of stream video client that will establish a WebSocket connection by connecting a user. Then we have to create a call object and join the call by specifying create to true to create the call if it doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and copy all of this and let's close all of the currently open files. I want this to have a clean working slate to prepare for setting up stream. So let's open up the file explorer and let's create a new folder in the root of our directory called providers. Providers are components that wrap our entire application and infuse it with additional functionalities. Within it, let's create a new file called stream client provider.tsx. Right here, we can paste what we copied. We're importing stream call, stream video, stream video client, and the user coming from stream IO video react SDK. And within here, we have to get our API keys, user IDs, tokens, and more. So let's remove this comment right here. And let's first focus on getting those values. Let's sign up and create a free account by using email, Google, or GitHub. Next, you can choose your username. You can do something like JSM underscore, and then type your name. I'm going to do JSM underscore Adrian. Next, you can choose your role, industry, app, user count, and more. Choose video and audio and complete sign up. And here we are. Welcome to stream. Let's start integrating our key and secret. So in this case, we have our JSM Adrian app with an app ID and the API key. In this case, let's copy the API key. 
and let's add it to our environment variables by creating a new variable called next underscore public underscore stream underscore API underscore key and simply paste it right there. Next, you can head to the dashboard. We can see our app ID here, but what we're after is our app secret. So let's open up the project, reveal our secret and copy it. Back within our environment variables, we can create a new stream underscore secret underscore key, which will be equal to the key that we just copied. Now we can go back to the stream client provider and start setting it up. First, we can define our API key. And now we can get it straight from our environment variables by saying process dot env dot next underscore public underscore stream underscore API underscore key. The user ID and the token we'll get later. I'll show you how we'll have to connect this to clerk so that each clerk user is connected to a stream user. That'll be very cool. Some more on that later. But for now, let's turn this from an app to a full blown stream video provider with which we can wrap our application. So for now, I'm going to remove everything just so it's easier to see and it's easier to develop. The only thing we need to start off is stream video and stream video client. These are the only two things we need for now. And what we need to do is wrap our entire application with this stream video. Similar to what we're doing with Clerk, we're wrapping everything with a Clerk provider. Here, we'll be wrapping it with a stream video provider. Next, let's export this app at the bottom by saying export default app. And let's rename it from app to something more fitting like stream video provider. Great. Now, every provider has to also return its children. So right here, we can get children from props and also give it a type children of a type react node coming from react. Now we can define our video client and we're going to define it as a state. So let's say use state snippet. We're going to call it video client like this set video client as well. And at the start, we're going to leave it empty. We're going to import use state from react and we're going to make it of a type stream video client. So it's nice that stream also provides us all of these types. So we know exactly which properties are available on our video client. And now we can say video client. We're going to attach it to this stream video right now. It's going to complain saying that it's undefined. And that's because we have to properly set this video client up. We're going to do it within a use effect. So let's define a use effect hook. You know, it has to have a callback function and a dependency array. Whenever variables in the dependency array change, the callback function will be recalled. And now things start to get interesting. Remember how I told you that later on we'll create a new stream user. Of course we need it to start its own meeting room, right? but we're going to create that stream user directly from our currently logged in clerk user. Let me show you how clerk makes it easy to get the information of a currently logged in user. We can do it by saying const user and is loaded is equal to use user coming from clerk next JS. Now we can add those two as dependency variables user and is loaded. So at the start, it's highly possible that we don't yet have the user. So if not is loaded or if the user doesn't exist, we're going to simply exit out of the function. Also, if we don't have the API key like this, we're going to also simply throw a new error, something like stream API key missing. There we go. So now we have two fail saves built in next only if the user is here and the API is here, we can create a new video client by saying const client is equal to new stream video client, which we call as a function and provide an options object. 
First parameter is the API key. Then we need to define which user is creating this client. Each user needs to have the ID, which we can simply grab from clerk by saying ID is user question mark dot ID. The second thing each user needs to have is a name. And that's going to be equal to either user question mark dot username or user question mark dot ID if we for some reason don't have the username. And finally, the image will be equal to user question mark dot image URL. Again, clerk nicely stores that for us. Now the last thing we need is something known as a token provider, something that will verify that this user indeed is that user. And to do that, we'll have to use this environment variable called stream secret key. Whenever a variable begins with next public, that means that it's exposed to the client side of our application. But if it doesn't have next public upfront, like clerk secret key or stream secret key, that means that we can only access it from the server side for security reasons. For that reason, we can create a new folder within our application called actions. And within actions, we can create a new file called stream.actions.ts. Why this file is special is that it's going to have a special use server directive, which means that the code within here will only be run on the server. And within here, we can copy this API key and use it same as we would on the client side. But now we also have access to const API secret is equal to process dot env dot stream underscore secret underscore key. Here we can create a function which we will export. So export const token provider is equal to an async function inside of which we'll get this token. First, we have to get the user from clerk by saying const user is equal to await current user coming from clerk next.js server. We can do a couple of checks like if there is no user, then we can throw a new error saying something like user is not authenticated or logged in. Then we can do another one. If there is no API key, then we can also throw a new error saying something like no API key. And we can duplicate that. And if there is no API secret, we can throw a new error saying no API secret. Great. Now we can begin by creating this new stream client const stream client is equal to new stream client. And this stream client won't be coming from stream IO video react SDK. Rather, it will be coming from the node SDK because we are on the server side. And if we were using this app within a regular react ecosystem, we would have to spin up a node express server. But here in Next.js, we can do it all in one. But we still do need to install that Stream.io node SDK package. So let's head back to the docs where we were in the quick start. And we can quickly switch to API. This API is basically the node SDK. And here, right at the start, we have the installation where we have to npm install Stream.io node SDK which we can do by simply running that command. And immediately after we have an example of creating a client. So to create a server side client, you'll need API key ains and secret found within the dashboard. Hey, we already know that. And then they give you an example of how to import stream client and create a new stream client using the API key secret and a timeout. So let's do that first. I'm going to put this to the side so we can refer to it later on. And we can import this stream client with a capital letter S coming from stream node SDK right here. We can call it as a function and we can pass the API key as well as the API secret. 
let's call it just client so it's easier to see. Now that we have the client, we can create users and user tokens, which is exactly what we're here for. See, it's called a token provider. So to create a user, you need to provide an ID and their role. Optionally, you can specify their name and an image as well. Tokens need to be generated on the server side. Typically, this would happen where you register or log in your users. Yes, that's it. So to create it, we'll have to do something like this. New user, new user object, and then insert a new object. What we care about the most is creating a new expiry date, as can be seen here. So let's simply copy this. Const exp, as in expiration, is equal to math that round, new date, get time, and then we implement a specific time. This is going to be a token that's valid for one hour. If you're not looking at the docs right now, you can just copy it from here. Once we have the client and the expiration, we also have to figure out when the token was issued. And we can do that by saying const issued is equal to math.floor date.now divided by 1000 minus 60. Something like this should do the trick. Once we have the client expiration and issued, we can create a new token by saying const token is equal to client.create token. And then we pass the user ID, which we have under the user.id. We pass the expiration, exp, and we pass the issued. Finally, now that we have the token, we can simply return it. And this is our server action executing only on the server that does the logic, taps into the API secret, creates a token for the user, and we can now call it right here within our stream video provider without ever needing to spinning up a Node Express server. Next.js is very powerful. And if you remember the ultimate Next.js course I talked about, in lesson 22, we dive into learning how to create server actions, which is exactly what this is, an action being executed on the server. With that in mind, we can now say token provider is equal to the token provider function coming from actions stream actions ts, and we can shorten it like this. That means that now we have everything needed to create a stream video client. So once we have created it, we can simply set it to the state set video client is equal to client. And we can also set it here, video client. But what happens if the video client is not there yet? Of course, at the start, this use effect will run, but before it runs, it will try to get this video client, which is undefined at the start. So we definitely have to provide some kind of a loader function. So if there is no video client, in that case, we can return, let's do a loader component. We can do that by creating a new component within the components folder called loader.tsx. We can run RAFCE. That can be a div with a class name equal to flex-center, h-screen, and w-full. Within it, we're going to simply render a self-closing image coming from next image with a source equal to icons or forward slash icons forward slash loading dash circle dot SVG. We can also give it an alt tag of loading and we can give it a width of 50 as well as a height of 52. So now we can go back to the stream client provider and simply return the loader in case we don't yet have the video client coming from components loader. And you can see now it no longer complains because it knows that the video client is the right type. Finally, once we have set up the client for the stream video, we can return the children right here which means that now we have infused our application with the power of video by creating a stream video client. And similarly, how we're wrapping our app with the clerk provider right here within our app layout 
you see this, we're wrapping our entire body. We're going to wrap the second layout within root layout. Right now, we're not doing anything here, but this will be super simple right now. We will wrap everything with the new component we have now created, stream video provider coming from ad providers, stream client provider, and the children will go within it. This means that now our entire application knows about this video client we have, how we have connected it to a specific user right here, the token and everything. So with that in mind, let's see what the next step within the docs is. And that is creating a call. You can now create a call by providing the call type and an ID. And here we have an example. So remember where we were the last time we were at home page, meeting type list, and then we were working on this function to create a meeting. And now finally that we have wrapped our entire application with stream video client provider, we can now initiate a call. First, let's check if a user exists by getting the user by destructuring it and saying use user coming from clerk next.js. And also we're going to initialize a stream video client by saying const client is equal to use stream video client coming from stream IO video react SDK. Now, if we don't have a client or if we don't have the user, we want to exit out. We cannot create a meeting without those two but we have used clerk to get our users and we have just now also set up our stream client. So it should be there. Next, let's open up a try and catch block. Usually whenever you have a try and catch, that means that the function must be async. In the catch, we can simply say something like console.log, there's gonna be an error. But what happens in the try is much more important. Here, we need to generate a random ID for this call. See, they're doing it right here as well. My first call. And just so we don't have to think of a new string every time, let's use a library that does that for us. Or at least that's what we needed to do not that long ago. But nowadays, it's as easy as saying const ID is equal to crypto.randomUUID, which will create the ID for you. Now, what is this crypto and where is it coming from? Well, let's check out the MDN reference. As you can see, crypto is a global property available to you just by using JavaScript. It allows you to quickly generate some random numbers and the random UUID method will simply generate a random ID. Once we have that, we can create a call by saying const call is equal to client of course, referring to the stream video client, that call, and we can provide the type of the call, we're gonna say default, and the ID of the call. Next, if we don't, for some reason, get a call, we can simply throw a new error, saying something like failed to create call. After that, if we succeed, we need to get a time that the meeting started at, and we can do that by saying const starts at is equal to, and for this one, we'll define a new use state variable. Use state, we're gonna call it values, set values, and at the start, it will be equal to an object that has a property of date time equal to new date. It has a description of the meeting equal to an empty string and a link of the meeting equal to an empty string as well. So now we can tap into those values and specifically tap into the date time, which is referring to the current date time and call the dot to ISO string, which will give us a string of that date time. Or if that doesn't work, we can create a new date and then pass the date dot now and then call the dot to ISO string like this. Now we know when it starts also, we can get the description of the meeting by saying cons description is equal to values dot description, or it can be called instant meeting, the new one we created. And finally, now that we have the starts at description ID call and everything else, 
we can await call.get or create. So depending if it already exists or if we need to create it, we pass an object and we pass additional data. This data will include a starts at equal to starts at, make sure to make it with an underscore right here for the key. And then we have a custom property, including a description. Once we create this call, we want to set it to the state. So let's create another state, use state snippet, call details, set call details. At the start, it can be empty and it will be of a type call. This call will be coming from stream video react SDK. Now, after we get or create a call, we can set call details to be equal to call. You can see so far, we're mostly following the docs right here. Then if there is no values dot description, we want to call a router dot push and push to a template string of forward slash meeting forward slash call dot ID. So we're navigating over to that specific meeting room that was just created. Now let's go back to our app and see if we broke something. Back in localhost, it seems like it has been broken for a long time, but we haven't been checking it in between. Our provider or stream client provider definitely needs to be a client component. So right here, we can give it a use client directive. That's going to fix this issue. And we're back onto the homepage. Hopefully you fixed this one on your own. Now, when we click new meeting, everything we have been building so far led to this moment. Once we click start meeting, this function will execute and we'll see whether we can create a call and push to the meeting page. So let's click start meeting. We indeed do get redirected to the meeting room with this newly generated ID. That's good enough for now. Before we go ahead and continue working on the meeting room, let's also implement ChatCN's toasts. A toast is a brief message that is displayed temporarily, like this one that says that something has been scheduled. In our case, we want to know whether the meeting room was successfully created. That'll be very useful for the user to know whether everything works or maybe something broke. So let's quickly add this ChatCN toast by installing it. Second, we have to add the toaster to the app layout. So let's copy this import and let's navigate over to app and then this primary layout where clerk is. Let's import right here, toaster. And let's use it right here below the main. Finally, how to trigger specific toasts is you use the use toast hook. So let's copy this go to the meeting type list, import this use toast, use it at the top of the component like this, const toast is use toast, and then we can call the function to initiate it. Let's first add it at the catch right here, if something goes wrong. So right here, we can use just the title, we don't need the description, and we can say something like failed to create meeting. There we go, that's good. We can also copy it and we can call it in a couple of other places. For example, right here at the top within the try, we can say if no values dot date time, this will be important if we're scheduling a meeting, then we can call a toast and say something like, please select a date and a time. That's good. And we can also return because we cannot proceed with the function. But more importantly, we can call it if something goes right. So right here at the bottom, after we navigate, we can call the toast with a title of meeting created. That's the most important thing we want to see right now. So now if we go back to localhost 3000, click new meeting and click start meeting, Oh, we cannot see too much happening. We're just redirected to the meeting room. Let's try reloading the page once more, clicking the new meeting and start meeting. Oh, there we go. The toast is here 
it says meeting created, but the design doesn't look that good. This would be the perfect opportunity for me to show you how we can style chats and components. You can go back to the layout, hold command or control, and then click on the toaster. Here on this div, you can see the original toaster code and we can style it a bit. By giving this toast a class name equal to border dash none, BG dark one, and most importantly, text of white. Now, if we go back to localhost, create a new meeting and click start meeting, you can see a nice looking toast that says meeting created, and we have a new meeting ID. So do you know what that means? It means that we can now navigate over to the meeting page, which is this special page.tsx within meeting ID page, a meeting room. Yep, we're finally transferring over from the homepage to first of all, not yet in a meeting room, but some kind of a waiting list setup where you can set up your mic, camera of choice and more, and then you can join the actual meeting room. Yep, soon enough, we'll be right within here. So first, let's do the setup page for the microphone and camera, and then we can focus on the meeting room itself. Right within this meeting room, we are already grabbing our params to know which meeting room we're in. But now within here, we also have to grab our currently authenticated user. And that's easy, right? We can simply say const user and is loaded is equal to use user coming from clerk next.js. But as soon as we do this, you'll notice that if you reload, it's gonna require us to turn this into a client side component. By the way, it's not saying that explicitly, right? It's just saying that there's an error. That's because this is a third party hook, not a hook that we wrote, but a hook nonetheless. So we still have to turn this into a use client directive component. And once we do this, we're now getting the user and we can also see the ID. So instead of simply showing the ID, let's do a bit more with it. Let's wrap everything in a main section with a class name equal to h dash screen and w dash full. So it's gonna take the full height and width of the screen. Within this main, we can wrap everything with a stream call coming from stream react video SDK. And then within it, we can also render the stream theme coming from video react SDK as well. Right within it, we want to know whether the audio and video setup has been completed or not. So to figure that out, let's create a new use state snippet called is setup complete and set is setup complete at the start equal to false. And we can import use state coming from react. If the is setup is not complete, then we want to render something like meeting setup. Else, if the setup has been completed, we want to render a real meeting room. Okay, that's cool. So we have either a meeting setup, like right now, as the setup hasn't been completed, or a meeting room. These will be two of our major components. So let's create them. Within the components folder, I can create the meeting setup.tsx where we can run RAFCE, and I will also create a meeting room .tsx, where I will also run RAFCE. Going back, we can simply import those two as regular self-closing components. That's gonna look something like this. We close them, we call them, and we import them coming from components. Great. Of course, we're gonna start with a meeting setup. But before we do that, we need to know within which call we're currently in. And we can do that by assigning a special variable call and passing it to this stream call. But how do we get access to the call we're currently within? Well, for that, we'll develop a custom hook. So we worked with server actions, we work with different providers, with client and server components, 
but we haven't yet created a custom hook. So believe it or not, within this video, we'll do that too. Let's create a new folder within the root of our directory called hooks. And within the hooks, we can create a new use get call by ID dot TS. And here we can create that hook. A hook is basically just a function starting with the word use. So we can say export const use get call by ID is equal to a function that accepts an ID of a type string or an array of strings that's going to look like this. And then we need to return the call. So let's define the use state inside of which we can fill our call and set call like this, we can import use state from react. And at the start, call will be empty. But we know that it will be of a type call coming from react video SDK, we can also create a loader, which is a new state called is call loading, set is call loading at the start set to true. Next, we can get access to our stream video client by saying const client is equal to use stream video client. And we can define a use effect. So we can start fetching our currently active cold. We're going to recall our use effect whenever the client changes, or when the ID of the call we're trying to fetch changes. And we have to import the use effect from react, right within here, we want to check if the client exists. And if it doesn't, we simply want to exit. On the other hand, if it does, we want to create a new load call function, which will be an async function. And then we want to immediately call it afterward load call. Now, why did I just declare a function and call it instead of just writing regular code like a normal person? Well, that's because this function is an async function. And you cannot write regular async await code within a use effect, unless you declare it as a new function. So that's why we needed to do it. Now, the next thing we have to do is query all of the existing calls and query it by a filter, which is ID. That should be pretty simple, right? We can simply do something like const destructure the calls and say that's equal to await client dot query calls to which we pass an object of filter underscore conditions where we simply filter by ID. Next, we want to check if calls dot length is greater than zero, meaning if we fetched any calls. And then if we did, we can set calls calls zero. So this is the first and most likely only call that we have fetched. That's going to be just set call. And finally, we can stop the loading by saying set is loading is going to be set to false. Great. So now we're setting the call. We also know when we're loading the call. And the only thing that a hook needs to do is return something. So at the bottom, we can say, return inside of an object call and is call loading. That's what hooks are for. You call a couple of hooks, you do some logic, and then you simply return the output call and is call loading. Going back to the page right at the top, we can say const destructure the call and is call loading is equal to use get call by ID which we import from our custom hook, and we simply pass the ID from the params. And of course, that ID is coming here. So we can immediately destructure it. Great. Now, just to be sure, if not is loaded, this is for the user, or if still is call loading, we can return a loader component, which we created not that long ago, coming from components loader. And finally, we now have the access to our call. And forever and ever, whenever we're within this stream call, we will know exactly which call we're in. This stream call provider ensures that. So with that in mind, we can now head over to the meeting setup and prepare our camera and microphone for the meeting. Within our meeting setup, we'll create a div with a class name, 
is equal to flex h dash screen for full height, w dash full for full width, flex dash call, items dash center, justify dash center, gap dash three, and text dash white. Within it, we can render an h1 that will simply say setup. Of course, we can style it a bit by giving it a class name equal to text-to-excel and font-bold. And within it, we'll render our first ever stream video component called Video Preview, coming from Stream.io Video React SDK as a self-closing component. Right now, it says video is disabled, and that's because we have to allow localhost to access our camera and microphone. So let's do just that by creating a new use state, which is gonna be called is mic cam toggled on. Okay, a bit of a long one. At the start, set to false. We also have to import use state from React. We'll also create a use effect like this with a callback function where we're monitoring the changes in that is mic cam toggled on. And we also wanna access the call itself. And that's now super easy because we have given access to our call to our stream call provider. So now we can simply say const call is equal to use call coming from stream video SDK. And this call contains access to camera and microphone. So we can say call.camera and call dot microphone. And of course we have to import use effect from React and we have to turn this component into a client component by saying use client. Within this use effect, if is mic cam toggled on, we can then disable it. So if it's already turned on, we can turn it off by saying call dot camera dot disable like this and call dot microphone dot disable like this, but else if it's not currently turned on, we can try to enable it by saying call dot camera dot enable as well as call dot microphone dot enable. And just like that, it will try to access your camera if you have previously given it your permission. For now, I'm gonna clear my cookies and cache just so I can show you how that looks like from scratch. Right now, the video is disabled. So if I reload, oh, I have to log in again. So let me do that. And it looks like it immediately gets it as we're on localhost. If we were on another website, you would have to give it permissions to get it. We can do another check and say if there is no call, so if we cannot connect, then we can throw a new error. Something like use call must be used within stream call component. That's important. And right now it is, we have it right here, stream call. So now that we have given it access to our webcam, right here, I can show this to you and it truly works. So for the first time you're seeing that I'm not an AI, I'm actually typing this out and explaining it to you. So with that in mind, let's continue. Now that we have given it video access, let's continue with creating the rest of this. We have video preview, but we don't yet have the possibility to modify our camera or microphone. And I hope this video right here isn't too distracting for you while you're trying to follow along. Right below this video preview, we can have a div and that div will have a class name equal to flex h-16 items-center justify-center with a gap of three. Within it, we can have a label for our input that will have a class name equal to flex items-center, justify-center, gap of two, and font of medium. And finally, we wanna create an input right within this label, which will be a checkbox. So a type equal to checkbox and a checked property equal to is mic cam toggled on with an on change where we get a callback function with an event set is mic 
cam toggled on, and then we pass in the e.target that value. So it's either on or it's off. And yeah, TypeScript saved me here. It's not value, that's for regular inputs. It's checked. So that's gonna give us a Boolean value. And we can say something like below the input, join with mic and camera off. So in case somebody wants to turn off both the mic and camera, they can easily do that and you can see how that works. That's nice. Right below this label, we can render the second video component coming from stream, which is device settings, coming from stream video react SDK. So let's see what this one does. As soon as we add it here and reload the page, we have added it here, but nothing seems to have appeared in the screen. A quick look at the docs says that this get device settings should open up a default device settings panel. But why is it not appearing for us? We should be able to get something that looks like this, where we can choose a camera, a mic, and more. But that's okay. I don't mind that too much for now. It might show up later. The most important thing is that whatever browser you're using, be that Arc like I am, or maybe Chrome, Safari, Mozilla, whatever it is, you can go to site settings, and then you can play with your camera and the microphone permissions. And you can allow them right here. That's the most important thing. Later on, we'll figure out why this device settings is not showing up, and then you'll be able to choose your preferred camera and microphone devices. For now, let's go below this div containing the device settings, and let's create a chat CN button, which we have to import from UI button. And let's create a class name equal to rounded-md bg green of 500, padding x of four and padding y of 2.5. And within it, we can say join meeting. There we go. So now we have this beautiful green button and we can give it an on click, which we'll call a callback function where we simply call the call.join method. And we can set the is setup complete variable from this page right here to complete. So let's pass it as a prop to meeting setup. Set is setup complete, which is equal to set is setup complete. We can accept it right here at the top. Set is setup complete, which is of a type function that returns void like this. And now at the bottom, we can simply call set is setup complete and set it to true. Looks like it's complaining a bit right now. That might be because it's not void. We need to give it a parameter. So when we define a type, it's gonna accept a value of a type Boolean and then return void. There we go, that's good. So now once we see that our camera is working or when we choose to disable it, we can then join the meeting. So let's give it a shot. If I click join meeting, we are successfully redirected to the meeting room because now the setup has been complete and we can now only see the meeting room component. So finally, we're diving into the part where we'll be able to have the grid of all of the participants within our meeting. So let's command click into the meeting room and let's start implementing it. First things first, we'll start with the layout. So let's transform this meeting room into a section with a class name equal to relative h-screen w-full overflow-hidden and padding top of four as well as text-white. This should set the tone. Right within it, we can have a div that will have a class name equal to relative, flex, size dash full, items dash center, and justify dash center. We're just creating the layout. One more time, we're gonna have a div with a class name equal to flex, size dash full, max dash W of 1000 pixels, and items dash center. Next, right here, we wanna render a layout component. 
that layout will be dependent on the layout state that the user chooses. So we can first create a new use state snippet called layout, set layout, import the use state, and at the start, it can be set to speaker dash left, where the speaker will show on the left side. Now we can have a couple different layout styles. So let's define them as the type. Type call layout type is equal to, it can be either grid, speaker left, or speaker right. So now we can define the type of this state by rendering the call layout type. Now that we know the type, we can create a new functional component, const call layout, which will render a specific layout depending on the current layout state. So we can have a switch statement. And under the switch, we're going to look for the value of layout. And if that layout is grid, then we can return a new component called paginated grid layout coming from video react SDK from stream. If the case is something like speaker dash, right, we can render another thing, which is going to be a speaker layout component from stream IO video react SDK with a prop of participants bar position equal to left. Participants are on the left, speaker is on the right. And we can duplicate this case one more time right below and call it speaker left. And participants in that case will be on the right. Or we can simply make this a default return because if it's not grid or speaker right, then it must be the default case. Great. So now we have this call layout, which we can just render right here. There we go. We can see our first user, which is JS Mastery. In this case, I turn my camera off so we can see the full logo appear. That's great. Let's continue with our layout. Right below this div, which is wrapping the call layout, we can create another div. This div will render all the participants. So let's give it some class names equal to h dash instead of square brackets, calc 100 VH minus 86 pixels. So this is for the navigation bar. We can say hidden margin left of two. So typically it will be hidden, but if we want to show the participants, we can make it active. So we'll definitely need some kind of a state, a new use state snippet called show participants and set show participants at the start set to false. Now we can make this dynamic and call a CN function right here coming from libutils. And to it, we can pass a string of all of these classes we have right now, end it right here. And as the second parameter, we can pass an object where we're going to trigger the show block property only if show participants is set to true. And right here, we can render the call participants list coming from react video SDK to it, we can pass the on close property. So we can close them as well, where we can call set show participants and set it to false. Right now, there are no other participants in the call. Let's see what happens if I try to join with another tab. There we go. I joined on the other screen and now we can see a participant appear right here over the screen. Of course, it's not looking ideal right now, but don't worry, we're just setting things up. We can now continue and go below these two divs and focus on video layout and call controls by creating another div with a class name equal to fixed bottom zero flex w dash full items dash center justify dash center as well and a gap of five. And right within here, we can render another stream react video component called call controls. There we go. And let's save it. And now we should be able to see a lot of different controls for managing our video, audio, and more right here at the bottom, but there's nothing to be seen. I do have this video camera coming from OBS, which is a recording program on my computer but don't worry about that. What matters is that call controls are nowhere to be found.
So with that in mind, I just remembered that we wrapped our entire meeting page right here with something called stream theme. And the React Video SDK ships with a default UI theme that you can include in your application. So the first thing we have to do is import the CSS that they provide to us. So let's copy this, or you can type it out with me and head over to layout, just the base one within the app. That is this one right here, outside of everything. And at the top, we can import at stream io forward slash video dash react dash SDK dist CSS style dot CSS. And now you can use this stream team and we can get all the base styles. Just reload the page and the styles should load in. Now, even back on our setup, you can see that now we have this settings icon, which allows us to modify all the different devices, microphone, speakers, and more. And here you can choose your camera. So if I switch to Adrian's iPhone camera, hopefully I'll be able to show you that I indeed am a real person. Here are my hands. And as you can see, I am typing right here on the screen with you. Great. So we can have this as our testing camera. Now with that in mind, we can also change the microphone and the speakers. So let's join the meeting. And as you can see, now that we have imported these stream video react styles, everything looks just a bit better. We have our primary screen right here. It says JS mastery. And if I modify my audio devices, for example, this microphone right here, it should also be reacting to sound, which is amazing. And on the bottom right, we can see the connectivity. So with that in mind, we can now go back to our meeting room and here are the call controls. Starting off from the left side, we have recording functionality. Pretty crazy that that comes out right out of the box with stream. If you click it, it is going to load and it seems that nothing is happening. But I do think that if we reload and then come back and it does seem like it's recording again, this is something we're going to look into more depth later on for now. I'm just going to pause it after the recording. We also have emotes. So that works right out of the box. You can give somebody a thumbs up, a thumbs down or confetti. Next up, we have complete screen sharing. Yep, it's built right in. You can share your entire screen with just a click. We're going to explore that later on a bit. Right here, you can choose from many different devices, or you can simply mute yourself. And you can see how it's automatically reflected right here on the screen. And then you can also choose from different camera devices or disable your camera. If you do disable it, you get this beautiful logo coming directly from your clerk profile. So with that in mind, you also have more functionalities here, such as muting audio, video, pinning it, and even more. And then at the end, there is the possibility to simply exit out of the call. So you can do that too. And let's also not forget that this will support multiple participants. So more people can join and chat together. We'll soon implement the button to change our layout as well. So you'll be able to see different users on either a big screen, small screen, grid screen, and more. As I said, a complete zoom clone. So just by following along with this video, you'll be able to integrate video solutions to any of your future applications. With that said, let's go below call controls and let's create our first drop down menu. We'll use the drop down menu to be able to change different types of layouts. Hey, drop down just displays a menu to the user, such as a set of actions or functions triggered by a button. So once we click it, we want to see some options. In this case, we can copy the installation command and simply paste it in our second terminal. Next, we can import all of the imports coming from ShatCN right here at the top. And we can copy the default use of ShatCN's dropdown menu. So let's simply paste it right here below call controls and let's properly indent it. Now, if we go back to the app, 
I can even turn on my cam. I have a bit of a different setup for you here right now. And what we can do is click this open button. And as you can see, we get a bit of a menu action going on. So let's now style it properly. First of all, we can wrap our drop down trigger within another div that will have a class name equal to flex and items dash center. We can simply put it within. Now we also wanted to render an icon called layout list coming from lucid react with a size of about 20 and a class name equal to text dash white. And of course we have to properly close it. That's a bit better. So now we have a button that looks like it can change layouts. Let's also give a few class names to our drop down menu trigger, such as a class name equal to, that's gonna be cursor dash pointer. We can also do rounded dash two XL. Let's do a BG off hash one nine two three two D. I found that to work the best. Padding X of four padding Y of two and on hover a BG dash hash four C five three five B. Now we have this button, which you can hover over and click. Great. Now let's focus on the drop down menu content itself. Let's give it a class name equal to border dash dark dash one, as well as a BG dark one and a text dash white. And immediately these icons are gonna look much, much better. Now we don't need all of these menu labels or menu items. So let's remove all of the menu items and the drop down menu label. And let's create a new dynamic block where we can map over grid, speaker left, as well as speaker right and we can call the dot map on it. We're gonna map over each individual item and we can also get the index of that item. And for each one, we can automatically return a div. That div will have a key equal to index and it will return a drop down menu item like this, which will simply render the item itself. So now we have the grid, speaker left and speaker right. Let's also give each drop down menu item a class name equal to cursor dash pointer. So now we can almost click on them. And we of course have to give it the actual on click. So let's say on click is equal to a callback function where we're going to call the set layout function or set state to which we're going to pass the item dot to lower case as call layout type. That's just for TypeScript to know that we're passing one of the types. And we can also introduce this drop down menu separator right below the drop down menu item and give it a class name equal to border dash dark dash one. There we go. So now we have a bit more space. And I noticed I misspelled speaker right here. There we go. So now if I click on grid, you can see it actually changes the view speaker left, that's good. And also speaker right. This works great. Now we can actually change the layout and it makes even bigger difference on desktop devices. I'm going to hide my camera for now as we don't need it. And the logo looks better and we can go below the drop down menu. Here we'll render a new button called call stats button coming from stream SDK. Now, if we save it, you'll see that a new button appears on the right side. It's almost out of view right now. So I'm going to bring it back into the view and click right here. As you can see, just by introducing a single component, we can see live call latency so that we know whether we can conduct quality video and audio calls through streams APIs. In this case, everything looks good on my end. Now, right below, let's add a button that will allow us to see or hide all the participants. We can give it an on click equal to, that's gonna be a callback function where we can call set show participants. And we're gonna 
make it a callback function where we get access to the previous state and we're going to call not previous state. So we're going to toggle it on and off. Within the button, let's render a div and that div will have a class name equal to cursor dash pointer, rounded dash to Excel, and we can copy all of the same class names from the button we had before. It's this one right here, BG caller, padding X, padding Y, and hover BG caller as well. So let's simply paste it here. And within it, we can render the user's icon coming from Lucid React with a size equal to 20 and a class name equal to text-white. And there we go, we have the user's icon. And just by clicking on it, you immediately get a nicely animated sidebar that shows you all the participants where you can even search and you can give or remove some permissions for other participants. This is amazing. As I said, this is so great because a lot of these features are coming directly from stream, which empower you to build incredibly scalable video experiences within all of your apps. Finally, we want to have a button that would allow us to end the meeting for everyone in case we are the room owner and if this is our private room. So let's create a new state at the top or we can figure it out by params by saying const is personal room is equal to search params dot get. And we're going to try to get the personal query from the URL. And to get the access to the search params, we have to say const search params is equal to use search params. Great. And now if we do have access to the personal, meaning that it is a personal room, then we want it to be true, else we want it to be false if we don't have access to it. So a quick trick to do that conversion from a true to your false value to a true Boolean value of true or false is to use a double exclamation mark. The first one will turn the falsy value like this one. Let's say that it is a personal meeting room. So we're going to get back something like personal. That is Trudy. So if we call not personal, we're going to get back a falsy value. So that's going to be false. And then we use another exclamation mark on false to get the true. Okay. So we're just turning a Trudy value into a real Boolean true. But if it's not personal, if it's undefined, we call a not on the undefined, which is true. And then finally we convert it into a Boolean false. So this is a quick lesson of why we use a double exclamation mark. Now that we know whether it's a personal room that we can actually close right below this button, we can render a dynamic block of code and say, if not is personal room, then we can render the end call button. And this is a component that we will create. So let's go to components and create a new end call button dot TSX run RAFCE and simply import it right here at the bottom. And I'm going to turn off my camera and join the meeting. And here we have our end call button. Now let's go into it and let's implement it right within here. We want to get access to the information about the call, which we can easily do by using the use call hook. Const call is equal to use call coming from react video stream SDK. And since we're using a hook, we must transform this into a use client component. Now that we have access to the call, we can use another hook called const use local participant, which is equal to use call state hooks coming from same stream IO video react SDK. And we can get access to that local participant by using the use local participant hook. In this case, we can simply call it local participant. There we go. So now that we have access to the call and the local participant, we can check whether we are the meeting owner. So const is meeting owner is equal to does the local participant exist? If they do check the call dot state dot created by 
Does that exist? Was this meeting created by someone? If it was, check if local participant dot user ID is equal to call dot state dot created by dot ID. So we're checking whether the ID of the owner is the same to the meeting of the current participant. And if we're not the meeting owner, so if not is meeting owner, and let me spell that properly, is meeting owner, we're gonna simply return null, meaning not show the button. But if we are the meeting owner, then we wanna show a chat CN button that looks something like this. We have to import it from UI button. And on click, we can give it an action, a callback action that is asynchronous. And here we can simply await call dot end call like this. And we also want to re-navigate back to the home page so we can get access to the router by saying const router is equal to use router coming from next router. And now we can say router dot push and want to push to the home page. Finally, I noticed that it should have been imported from next navigation. So I'm going to fix this and I'm going to let the button say something like end call for everyone. And we're going to give it a class name equal to BG red 500. There we go. End call for everyone looking great. So let's give it a spin. I'm going to click end call for everyone. It ended the call and redirected us back to the home page. That is great. Now let's make some small adjustments to make our app function even better. We can get access to the use call calling state by saying const use call calling state is equal to use call state hooks coming from react video SDK. And then we can get access to the calling state calling state is equal to use call calling state. This is pretty interesting and something that I have never seen before. The stream team created a use call state hooks hook, which is a function that exposes all state hooks, a pretty interesting thing to do. So basically you say, Hey, I want to get this hook and you get access to it. And then you can do something with it. Now that we have the calling state, we can check if calling state is not equal to calling state dot joined like this. And this calling state we can import from stream video SDK. And if that is the case, we can return a loader component, which of course we have to import from loader. Now let's quickly fix this modal start an instant meeting. Let's see where that is. That is right here under meeting types and then meeting modal here. It looks like I forgot to put a space between the max W and flex call. So just a simple space will do the trick. Now let's click start a meeting. Next, let's join the meeting and see if there's something we can do here. Well, some of these buttons are jumping out a bit. So let's go to the meeting room and let's see where we're calling the buttons. Here, call controls, fixed, bottom. Maybe we can add a flex wrap into the mix. There we go. That's much better. This makes the buttons wrap. So as we expand, you can see they nicely show on the screen. And we can also play with the layouts. Of course, we don't have any people in right now, but this is looking good. Another thing that I noticed that we still didn't do is modify our favicon and title. So to fix it, we can go to our primary layout, which is this one right here and add a title of something like Yoom or zoom. You can add a description of something like video calling app, and we can add icons icon forward slash icons forward slash logo dot SVG. Now, if you do this, you can see this looks much, much better. Now let's end the call for everyone we get redirected and you can notice that we also have to move this metadata to other layouts as well for this to work. So we have to add it here. Don't forget to import the metadata type 
coming from metadata from next. And we can also do it for the home layout as well. So paste it here and import metadata from next. Great. With that in mind, as you can notice, we're kind of slowly starting to make these smaller quality of life changes as we're approaching the end of this amazing build. But we have only made our first box work. Start an instant meeting. What do you say that we focus on the next one right now, which is schedule a meeting? That's going to require a bit of a different functionality. So let's focus on that right now. Let's navigate back to our meeting type list. These are the cards on our homepage. And right now we're always showing a single modal, which is the one for starting an instant meeting. But instead of doing that, let's do a bit of dynamic checking. Let's check if call details exist. That's coming from the top right here, call details. And if they don't exist, that means that we want to create a new meeting or schedule a meeting. So then we can render a new meeting modal. And as a matter of fact, we can just copy this one as they're quite similar. So this is going to be the one not for starting an instant meeting. Rather, this one will be opened if we turn on the is schedule meeting. The title will be something like create meeting. And we don't need the button text nor the class name. Next, if the call details already exist, we want to show a different kind of modal. So I'm going to open up a new block. And once again, I'm going to paste the copy of this create modal right now. There we go. This one will also be is schedule meeting. It's going to say meeting created as the title. And the handle click will be just a bit different. It will be a callback function where we're going to call the navigator dot clipboard dot write text. So you can do this to copy the meeting link once we actually have one. But first, we'll have to schedule it. And then we can also render something like a toast that's going to say title of link copied. So once we actually schedule it, we'll be able to do this to show that to the user. Next, let's add the image of forward slash icons, forward slash checked dot SVG, a button icon of forward slash icons, forward slash copy dot SVG, and a button text equal to copy meeting link. And we don't need this button text right here. Great. So now we have a modal that opens up at the start if we don't yet have call details, and then the other one once we do have the meeting details. So how are we going to schedule a meeting? Well, for that, we'll expand our meeting modal. We won't make it just a typical self-closing component. We will pass some children into it. So whatever you type into it will appear right here, which is pretty cool. It allows us to make this modal a bit different from the typical new meeting modal. This one will have additional fields. And going back to our Figma design, it shows us how it should look like. It should have something like the description and a date and time. And then once we create it, we'll be able to copy the invitation. This is what we're working on. It's much easier to understand what we're building when you can visualize it within Figma, right? So would you like to see a Figma shared every time when we develop one of these projects? Let me know in the comments down below. With that said, let's create this form. We're going to wrap everything in a div. And that div will have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and a gap of 2.5. It will also have a label. And let's go back to our code so we can see it. Off, add a description that will have a class name equal to text dash base, text dash normal, and leading of 22 pixels that will change the line height. We can also make it a text sky too to change the color a bit. Below it, let's render a text area. And this is a special text area component coming from ShatCN. 
So you know the drill, let's install it by running mpx chassis and UI latest add text area. Now we can import it from chat CN and schedule a meeting. There we go. It looks good, but let's style it a bit by giving it a class name of border dash none bg dash dark dash three focus dash visible of ring dash zero and focus dash visible dash ring dash offset dash zero. We need to do this to override some of the default behavior from these text areas, such as this ring that happens if you can see it. So this is a colon right here. And now it doesn't occur. That's great. Let's also give this text area an on change, which will get the event, a key press event, and set values to an object where we spread all of the previous values and modify the description to be equal to e.target.value. Great. And finally, now we have to add an actual date and time picker. And for that, we'll use the React Date Picker package. So let's run npm install React Date Picker and press enter. Just like that, below this text area and below the div that's wrapping it, we can create another div. This div will have a class name equal to flex w full flex call and a gap of 2.5. Within, we can also have the same label as we had above, but this time it will say something like select date and time. There we go. And finally, we can render a React Date Picker component, React Date Picker, like this. It's going to be a self closing tag. And we have to import it at the top by saying import React Date Picker coming from React Date Picker. Let's make sure we install that package correctly. There we go. I think we did, but for some reason it has trouble finding it. So if I exit the file and come back, yep. Oh, that's because we have to also install the types for that package, which is always handy. So just copy this command that you get on hover and then paste it right here. This will allow us to know whether we're using it properly or not. It's going to tell us exactly which properties are we missing. The first property we need is the actual value. So we can say selected is values dot date time like this. Then on change, the way that works is we get a callback function where we get the date and then we set values similar to what we have done with the text area. So we do an object, we spread the previous values and then we modify date time to be equal to date. And for TypeScript, we also have to add an exclamation mark at the end. Next, let's see how that looks like right now. Okay, doesn't look that good. Let's give it a show time select to make it look even worse. There we go. Let's also give it a time format of HHMM like this. Let's give it time intervals to something like 15 minutes time caption of something like time date format will be a bit longer m m m m d y y y y h m m and then a a it's a long one i know but it will allow us to properly see all dates and times and let's give it a class name equal to w dash full rounded bg dash dark dash three padding of two and focus of outline dash none. So now if we come back, this looks just a tiny bit better, but for this package, I do believe that we also need its corresponding CSS file. So if we go back to our layout within the app, right below the stream video SDK CSS file, we also need to import 
a react dash date picker forward slash dist forward slash react dash date picker dot CSS. So I think you can start noticing how all of these external packages might have their own CSS files, which you need to import. So now if we reload the page and go to schedule a meeting, you can see that now we have something that looks like a decent looking calendar. And of course you could further style it, but for now, this is good enough. So we can choose a date and we can choose a time for when we want to schedule a meeting. We can also add a description. Great. So let's give it a shot. Let's say new JSM video brainstorming session. So we can choose a nice topic for you guys. And I'm going to do something like 22nd at let's do 2 PM and schedule meeting. There we go. Meeting created and we got a meeting link, which we can copy or we cannot yet. But if we go back here and we uncomment this code, we should be able to get a meeting link. So that's now the question, where are we going to get the meeting link from? Well, remember how before right here within this function, we set call details to the call when we create a new call. Well, what we can do right here above the return is say const meeting link is equal to a template string where we first render the process dot env dot next public base URL. So currently this will be localhost, but when we deploy it, it will be your own domain name. So what do you say that we go right here to environment variables? and actually create this next public base URL. I don't think we need those strings right here. And this is actually the last environment variable of the day. On our current localhost, it will be localhost 3000. Later on, we will change it to a domain where our app gets deployed. And we're going to also add the forward slash meeting and forward slash call detail question mark dot ID. And I think I'm missing an S right here. There we go. So now if we schedule our meeting and click schedule, it says meeting created and we immediately get navigated over to it. But what mattered even more was to see right here, meeting created, there we go, it's in the future. And we can copy the meeting link and it says link copied. And then we can share it with somebody. This is great. So now that we can create instant meetings, and more importantly, we can schedule those meetings, let's implement our upcoming meetings page, where we can see all of the meetings that we have scheduled. To do that, we can navigate to our upcoming page right here within home. And we're going to be smart right from the start. We'll create a component that we'll reuse across upcoming previous and recordings, as all of these will show similar screens. And this is yet another reason why it's good to have a proper plan before starting with the development. As you can see, in the design, it's pretty clear what we have to show on the upcoming meeting, some kind of a card that has an icon, a title, date, people who will be joining, start and copy invitation. In the previous meetings, it's basically almost the same besides the start and copy invitation as the meeting has already been completed. And then for the recordings, it's also almost the same, but we show a bit of a different information like the start time, the ID, and then the play and share buttons. So with that in mind, let's create a reusable call list component, which will render a different set of cards. So going to the components folder, and creating a new component called call list.tsx. There we can run RAFCE and import that call list right here under upcoming. And we're going to import it. And we're going to be smart right off the bat. And we're going to pass it a type, which is a prop that will help us recognize whether this is upcoming or recordings or something else. So now that we're passing it, we can go into the call list 
and start implementing it. First, we're gonna get access to the prop called type, which will be of a type, ended, or upcoming, or recordings. So now we know exactly what the type can be. Next, let's work on fetching those calls. To do that, we'll create a custom hook. So let's go to hooks and create a new hook called use get calls.ts. Within here, we can export const use get calls, which will be our custom hook like this. And let's figure out how we can load those calls. First, we'll need to create a use state snippet called calls and set calls as well. At the start, equal to an empty array, and it will be of a type call array, which has to come from stream. We also have to import the use state. Great. Now, how do we get those calls? Well, we're going to get them by using the client, which is equal to use stream video client. Through it, we'll be able to fetch our calls. So let's also create another use state that will allow us to track of the loading state when we're fetching them. So is loading and set is loading at the start set to false. And also we have to fetch calls for a specific user. So we can also get the user by saying const user is equal to use user coming from clerk. See how easy it is to now fetch the user, the video client and more and make them work together to do whatever our app needs to do. Next, let's create a use effect. It has a callback function and then a dependency array. Within a dependency array, we'll listen to the changes for the client as well as the user question mark dot ID. Because we have to have both to be able to properly fetch the meetings for that user. And as you know, the fetching of the calls is asynchronous and we cannot simply put a wait or make this function right here async. That doesn't work. So what we have to do is create a new async function. So const load calls, which will be equal to an async function. And we can call it right after load calls. Next within load calls, if there is no client or if there is no user question mark dot ID, we can simply exit out of the function. So simply return else we can set the is loading to true because we're starting to fetch the calls. So let's open up a try and catch block to make sure that everything goes right. And we can also add a finally clause where we can stop the loading. So whether we succeed, or whether something goes wrong, in any case, we need to stop the loading. And in the catch, we can simply console log the error. So what matters the most is what is in the try. Here, we can destructure the calls by calling the await client, this is the video stream client, dot query calls. And of course, this is also within the docs, where you can call the query calls and then pass different options as you would into any other database, like sorting options, limiting options, and more. You can filter by ID, by the team, by the type, even by created by user, which is gonna be very useful in our case. So let's do just that. We can pass an options object into query calls, where we first wanna sort them by field starts at and direction of minus one. So this is interesting. We're sorting them by when they start because it's not really important when we created them. Since these are upcoming meetings, we want to sort them by the starting date. We also want to filter them somehow so we can apply filter conditions and also filter them by whether the start at property exists. So we can say dollar sign exists is set to true. These are the only calls we want to show, or we can run the dollar sign or add an array and then filter by created underscore by underscore user underscore ID, which we're targeting for the user ID. 
this is the currently logged in user. Or if members is in user.id, like this. Make sure to copy it exactly as it is. So we want to show this call if we are the one that created it or if we're the member within the call. Finally, once we fetch the calls, we want to set calls to be equal to calls. Wonderful. Now that we're fetching all the calls, we want to make this hook reusable too. So what we could of course do is just return calls and call it a day. But instead, I want to filter them out. I want to create multiple variables, const ended calls, const upcoming calls, const recordings. And then we want to return all of that inside of an object. So we want to pass ended calls, upcoming calls. For the recordings, we're going to pass over all the calls because we're going to do some additional filtering later on. And we also want to pass the is loading state. So now the last thing we have to do is figure out the logic for knowing how to filter out the ended and upcoming calls. First of all, we have to get access to the now time by saying const now is equal to new date. Because if it's after now, it's an ended call. And if it's before now, it's an upcoming call. So let's first deal with ended calls by saying it's equal to calls.filter, where we can immediately destructure the state of a call and then destructure the starts at as well as ended at variables. And that's going to be of a type call. Then for each one of these, we can return inside of parentheses if starts at exists and if new date of starts at is lower than now or if double exclamation mark ended at. So if it already ended, that means that it is an ended call. If the start date is lower than now and if it has already ended. Now for the upcoming calls, we're going to do it a bit differently by saying calls dot filter. Once again, we're going to destructure the state of the call and then destructure the starts at that's going to be of a type call. And we're going to return if starts at and if new date starts at is greater than now, then it means it's an upcoming call. So now we are returning ended calls, upcoming calls and recordings from the use get calls, which we can now call within the call list. As the call list is a reusable component that can show the upcoming recordings and ended, it is only suiting that the use get calls hook will also be reusable. So let's call it const ended calls, upcoming calls, call recordings. We have to properly call it like that within the use get calls as well. So let's call it call recordings. And finally is loading is equal to use get calls coming from hooks use get calls. There we go. Now we can do something with that. First of all, we have to figure out on which page are we on? Are we on upcoming or are we on something else? And of course, don't forget to make this a use client because we're calling hooks. So now based off of the parameter that we are on, such as the upcoming right here at the top, we have to figure out where we are. For that, we can use the router by saying const router is equal to use router coming from next navigation. And then we can create a new function const get calls, which will return the exact type of calls that we want to get back depending on the page we're on. So we can use a switch statement and depending on the type of our call, which we're passing through props, we can now either return ended. So if case is ended, return ended calls. Then if case is recordings, we can return 
Now for the recordings, we'll create a new use state. Snippet called recordings and set recordings at the start equal to an empty array. Let's not forget to import the use state and make the call recording of a type call recording. Again, it's a bit different working with recordings rather than it is with calls. So we'll have to do some additional filtering with that later on. But for now, we can return recordings. And finally, let's make a case for upcoming. And here we can return upcoming calls. Is that how we call them? Upcoming calls? Let's make sure. Oh, yeah, upcoming calls and that calls that is looking good. And default, we can simply return an empty array. Great. So now we can call this get calls to get the exact type of calls we're after. Also, to make our life easier, let's duplicate this function. And let's call it get no calls message. So in case we don't have any ended calls, we can say no previous calls. If we don't have any recordings, we can say no recordings. And finally, if no upcoming calls, we can say no upcoming calls. And by default, we can return an empty string. So now that we have the calls and that we have the get no calls message, we can start creating the JSX to show all of our cards. Let's first wrap everything in a div that will have a class name equal to grid. Yeah, so this is the second time we'll be using a grid. And as I told you, when you have just cards that show one on top of another or one next to another, using a grid is the way to go. So we can say grid dash calls dash one, a gap of five on extra large devices, grid dash calls dash two, which means two per column. Next, right here, we want to map over our calls. So we're not going to do a separate call for, you know, call recordings or one for upcoming calls or stuff like that. Right here at the top, we want to call const calls is equal to get calls, which will call this function and return the exact type of call that we need to get. And we can do the same thing for the calls message. So no calls message is equal to a function call to, to get no calls message. Now we can map over the calls only if they exist. So if calls exist and if calls that length is greater than zero, then we can call the calls dot map where we map over each individual meeting of a type call coming from stream video SDK or call recording also coming from stream video SDK. And for each one, we can return something known as a meeting card. This is a new component we'll create so we can reuse multiple cards. So let's create it within the components folder called meeting card dot TSX run RAFCE and let's import it right here. Also, I didn't provide the ending statement right here. So I have to say if calls don't exist, then we can render an H1 that set, that renders the no calls message. And of course, let's fix the indentation right here. I am ending this one here. I have to end another more and I have to import the meeting card. Yeah, this is looking good to me. There we go. So it renders the meeting card. That's great. So let's go into this card. And this is the card we have seen on Figma before. Looks like this for previous meetings. And it looks like this for upcoming meetings. It is a card similar to the one we have created for the homepage with two buttons, images, and some additional info. So with that in mind, I want to invite you to create it. Give it a shot, pause this video, open up Figma. Try doing the card for upcoming meetings. You don't even have to make it real data yet. You can just use the fake title, time, and so on. Also create a version for previous meetings with conditional rendering of the buttons. So you can dynamically show or hide them depending on the meeting type and also do it for meeting recordings. Pause this video right now and let me know how it goes. 
After that, I'll provide you with the code. Good luck. So how did it go? Well, let me paste the code right here for the meeting card. It's about 90 lines long and it starts off just as a section covering an article, which is basically a div where it shows the image for the upcoming meetings. Then we map over the images of avatars. I should have mentioned that this is coming from the images within the public folder. And then finally, if it's not a previous meeting, we also show some buttons like the one to watch the recording or to copy the link. And for these avatar images, they're coming from constants. So we have to actually create them. So let's go to constants and let's export const avatar images is equal to an array of forward slash images forward slash avatar dash one dot JPEG. And we can now duplicate this four more times, do avatar two, three, four, and five. And we're now properly importing them and mapping over them. So now what we have to do is go back to the call list and pass all the necessary props to make her card shine. And in case your code looks a bit different from this one, you can find this complete code within the readme down below. Just go to the GitHub repo and find the provided code. The most important thing you needed to learn here is that we can pass additional props into this meeting card. Props like the icon, title, date, is previous meeting, and more that then change the look and feel of the card depending on where that card is showing. And that's true for any reusable components in the future. So let's copy all of these props and let's add them to the meeting card. Of course, I want to remove the commas and rather make it an equal sign like this. So now let's start passing proper stuff to the meeting card. First off, as we're mapping over it, it needs a key equal to, we can do meeting question mark dot ID. And just so TypeScript doesn't complain, we need to say that the meeting is of a type call so that it knows that the ID exists on it. Then we can pass the icon and don't worry, the app right now doesn't even work. And that's because we need to fill some data into all of these empty objects. So instead, for now, I will just make it an empty string and that way it will at least work. There we go. We have a card at least, which doesn't yet have the data. But now as we start filling the data in, it will be better and better. And if there's nothing happening for you here in the upcoming, you must go to home and schedule a meeting for the future. So let's add a description, something like, let's do new JSM video live session and let's add it for let's say this Friday at noon and schedule meeting. Now, if we go all the way to our upcoming meetings, you can see two different meeting cards. Let's modify the icon. If the type is triple equal to the ended meeting, then we can render forward slash icons forward slash previous dot SVG. But else if the type is triple equal to upcoming, then we can do something like forward slash icons forward slash upcoming dot SVG. And else if it's not upcoming or previous, it will be icons recordings dot SVG. So now we have the icon, both of these are upcoming. Next, we have the title. In this case, we can say something like meeting dot state dot custom dot description. So this is the description we have added to the meeting. And if it's a bit longer, we can also just take the first 20 characters like dot substring from zero to 20. So we cut it a bit or we simply show no description. There we go. This looks good. And it looks like TypeScript is complaining a bit. The property state does not exist on type call or call recording. This is interesting. So right now it doesn't know whether the meeting here in this case is a call or call recording. If it's a call, it will have the state 
if it's not a call, it won't have the state. So we have to say meeting as call, and then it will know it has access to the state. Next, let's work with the description where we can say meeting dot state dot starts at dot to locale string like this. And now we have the date or if it's a recording, it will be a bit different. It will simply be start underscore time dot to locale string, which we call as a function. And this start time is also coming from the meeting. Now, every time we would have to wrap this in either a call or a recording, but in this case, I will just ignore TypeScript for this entire file, just so we don't have to type it out. So at the top, I'm gonna add a comment of TS ignore. Or if you wanna do it for the entire file, it's simply no check, I believe. And there we go, now it's good. So now we have the date and we have the title. And maybe we can do a bit more characters here so everything fits. There we go, this is great. Now let's check if we have access to the previous meeting. So we can say if type is triple equal to ended, then it is a previous meeting and it should not have any buttons. Right now, that's not the case. The button icon, if type is triple equal to recordings, will be equal to forward slash icons, forward slash play that SVG. So we can play the recording, else it will be undefined. Right now we're not under recordings, but we do have a button text. And if the type is equal to recordings, then it will be play, else it will be start. Then we have the link, which if the type is triple equal to recordings, then the link will be equal to meeting.url, and that's it. Else, if it's not a recording, we have to create a new meeting link. So it will be a template string of process.env.next underscore public underscore base underscore URL to make it work for a deployed application as well, forward slash meeting forward slash, and then we can say meeting.id. So we're crafting the entire link. Finally, it looks like I have two button texts and I can remove the second one. So now the button says start. In the handle click, we wanna check if the type is triple equal to recordings. And if it is, then we wanna create a callback function that will call the router dot push and push to a template string of meeting dot URL like this. Else we want to do another callback function where we call the router dot push and we push to a template string of forward slash meeting forward slash meeting dot ID like this. There we go. So now we have a complete upcoming card. Let's reload the page one more time. First, we have the loading. We can briefly see no upcoming calls right here. Why is that? That's because it seems that at the start, the calls.length doesn't exist, so it renders it. What we can do is we can say if is loading, then we show the loader. So return loader coming from dot slash loader. Let's see if we have a proper loading now. It loads, it loads, and then they show without flashing the no calls message. That's great. So now we have our upcoming cards, which look great. We can copy the link of a meeting immediately. This works. And we can start the meeting right off the bat, which navigates us to the meeting setup page. This is phenomenal. But now what would happen if we navigate over to previous? Well, right now, not too much, right? So maybe to test it out, we could schedule a new meeting, call it, let's have a meeting now, and it will happen right this minute. 
I will schedule it and I will join that meeting. Let's join it. We are in and I'm going to end the call for everyone. And now if we go to previous, there's nothing there. But as you can notice, we don't have cards, but also we don't have the no calls message, which means that now if you go to the previous meetings page, the only thing we have to do is call our reusable call list component and we have to pass the ended prop to it. So the type is equal to ended. Let's save it. And there we go. Let's have a meeting now, as well as a couple of instances of instant meetings we have created before. This is wonderful. And notice that due to the conditional rendering, they don't have the buttons to check them out or do anything else with them. This is great. Let's also see it on full screen. Oh, it looks like some of our avatars break. That's not good. So if I go to our constants, it looks like I have avatar one, two, three, and so on. Oh, I think only the first two are JPEGs and the rest are going to be PNGs. So that was my bad right here. And of course, this is right now hard coded, but of course, if you want to, you can just remove it or show anything else right here. This is it for the previous nicely shows up in a grid right here. And for the upcoming, you can actually copy the link or start a meeting. Now, the last thing we have right here are the recordings. Before I played a bit with the recordings and tried to get the meeting recorded, it did kind of say that it was recording, but I'm not sure if the recording was saved. So let's go to recordings page and let's also render the call list. And let's pass type is equal to recordings. And let's see what happens. Yep, it says no recordings for now. But of course it says that. That's because these recordings right here are currently empty. So what we have to do is some special logic to extract the recordings from each meeting. So let's go right here below the get no calls message. And let's create a use effect within which we will fetch the recordings for each specific call. It's a typical use effect where we look for the type and we look for the call recordings. Within here, we want to create a function called const fetch recordings is equal to an async function. And of course, we call it at the bottom only if type is triple equal to recordings, we can call fetch recordings. So now how do we fetch recordings for each different call? Well, first let's get the access to actual meetings that these members were in by saying const call data is equal to await promise dot all because we can fetch multiple things at the same time. We want to get into the call recordings dot map and map out each meeting. And for each one call the meeting dot query recordings, which will give us back the recordings for each one of our meetings. Next, we want to extract those recordings by saying const recordings is equal to call data dot filter. For each call, we want to ensure that the call dot recordings dot length is greater than zero so that it actually has any recordings attached to it. And then we want to call something known as a dot flat map. So what a flat map does is if you have an array with multiple arrays, for example, if each one of these arrays is a meeting, and it has a recording one for that meeting. It also has a recording two. Then you have another array within that array with recording three and so on. What the flat map will do is it will go through all of the arrays and put them within the same single array so that it looks like this. Just give us back a list of recordings. So here we can get all different calls and simply say, return me all the recordings from each call. 
flatten it out. Once we get the recordings, we can set them to the state by saying set recordings is equal to recordings. Now, if we save it, it says use effect is not defined, so we have to import it from React. But after that is done, we get two more errors or three more errors. The first one is that we're trying to invoke a constructor without the keyword new, which is happening under promise.call. So it looks like I misspelled it here. It was supposed to be promise.all. So try to get the recordings from all of these meetings at the same time. If we do that and reload, we get cannot read properties of custom for the description. Okay, that's because the recordings don't have descriptions. So if I go here, the title will be meeting state custom description. And right here, we have to add a question mark dot. So it doesn't break our app if it doesn't exist. We also have to do the same thing for starts at at line 96. So meeting dot state question mark dot starts at. And there we go. We have two different meetings. And instead of simply saying no description, we can add another or right here and say meeting dot file name dot substring and get the first 20 characters. So this will give us the ID or the name of that recording. This is great. And we can also try to play that recording, which will navigate to the actual recording of that meeting, which is pretty crazy. Although right now it's an empty screen, we'll try to make it work later on. So let's see it. There we go. This one is working. It shows us the entire screen where we had our camera and where I was testing different emojis. That's great. And we can also copy the link. Now, sometimes you might get an error saying too many requests happening at the same time for this promise that all. So for that reason, we can add a try and catch, put all of this in the try, and in the catch, we can just add a toast right here by using the toast at the top. So const toast is equal to use toast coming from UI toast. And it has to be within curly braces. And then if we cannot fetch it, we can return a toast that says title try again later. So now if you reload, it looks good to me. We don't get it now, but as I said, if you do get, oh, there we go. We did get it. Try again later. So this happens if you try to reload and try to fetch too many recordings at the same time. With that in mind, our upcoming meetings are now done. You can start them early or you can copy the link and send it to your friends. Then, we have the previous meetings, which you can just see right here and remember what happened. And then we also have the recordings right here, which looks like we tried to call too many of them, but you saw that it was working before. So there we go. If you reload after some time, you will be able to get it and you can play them or even copy the link to the recording and share it with your friends and colleagues. Now, with that in mind, our app is looking better and better every second. And what we can do next before we finalize our meeting page and the rest of these home cards is focus on the personal room. This is similar to just creating a new instant meeting, but instead it allows you to send all of your meeting details at all times with your own personal invite link. So let's create that next. To get started with creating our personal meeting room, we can navigate over to the personal room page.tsx right here within our app, root, home, and then personal room. Right here below this H1, we can create a div that will have a class name equal to flex w full flex call gap of eight, and on extra large devices, max dash W of 900 pixels. And right within it, we want to start creating the layout you have seen not that long ago. And for that, we'll create our own custom functional component called table. 
so we can say const table, is equal to a function that accepts the title and description as props, and it can immediately return a div that will have an h1 within it that will render the title, and right below it, it will also render an h1 that will render the description. Of course, we also have to define the types of these props. Title will be a string and description will also be a string. Now, right within this div, we can call our table component like this, and we can pass it a title equal to topic, and we can pass it a description equal to, it will be a template string of user question mark dot username. We're going to add an S. So there meeting room. And of course we have to get access to the actual user. And I think by this point, you know how to do that right at the top. We can say const user is equal to use user coming from clerk next JS. Looking at the title right here, it says that the topic is not assignable to type string. Let's see why that is. I should have just said string like this. There we go. This is good. And also since we're using a hook, we have to make this a use client component. There we go. And now we have topic tests meeting room. Now we can style this a bit by giving this div a class name equal to flex flex dash call items dash start gap of two and on extra large devices flex dash row. We can style the H1 by giving it a class name of text dash base font dash medium text dash sky dash one on large devices text dash XL and on extra large devices min dash W of 32. We can also style the description by giving it a class name of truncate. So we can cut it out if it's too long. If we spell that properly, truncate text dash SM font dash bold on max SM devices, max dash W of 320 pixels and on large devices, text dash XL. There we go. So now we have a topic and we have the description. In this case, I'm logged in as a test user, but we can easily fix that if I go here. Oh, look at that nice animation coming from clerk. That's nice. And I can sign out. Now I logged in through my JSM account and we can check out the personal room and we can see JS Mastery's meeting room. We can also make the meeting room small so that it looks great with a username. Great. Now we can duplicate this table two more times. One, two. The second time, the title will be the meeting ID. And in the description, we can simply render the meeting ID. Meeting ID. But the question is, where are we going to get the meeting ID from? Well, since this is our personal room, the meeting ID will be equal to the user ID. So we can say const meeting ID is equal to user question mark dot ID. And for TypeScript, we can add an exclamation mark at the end. The last table row will be simply an invite link. And there we can render a meeting link. Once again, where are we going to get the meeting link from? Well, we can generate it. And I think we have already created this link before. So meeting link. Yep, here it is. So we can copy it const meeting link coming from meeting type list and we can paste it right here. But in this case, it will be meeting forward slash meeting ID because it's a personal room. And we're going to also add question mark personal is equal to true. So we know that it's a personal room. And now we can simply use that meeting link right here in the description. And you can see how nicely we have created these three table rows. Now we also want to go below this div and create another div that will have a class name equal to flex gap of five. And right within, we want to render a chat CN button and we have to import it from components UI button. 
we're gonna also give it a class name equal to bg-blue-1 and an onClick property equal to. And here, we're gonna create a new function that will start a new meeting room. So let's create it right here at the top. Const start room is equal to an async function and we'll implement the functionality a bit later. For now, we can simply call start room. And right here, we can say something like start meeting. And we can have another button right below that will have a class name equal to bg-dark-3. And we can also give it an on click equal to a callback function. And here we want to copy something to clipboard. And I think we have already wrote similar code. So we can just search for navigator dot clipboard, copy to clipboard. There we go. We used it in the meeting card. So we can copy this navigator and the toast and simply add it to this on click. And we're going to copy the meeting link this time. And we also have to get the toast. And the way that you get the toast is at the top by saying const toast is equal to use toast coming from components UI toast. And we can say something like link copied. And the button itself will say copy invitation. There we go. So this is our personal room. If I click copy invitation, we see link copied, make sure to reload the page and then try it out. And if I click start meeting, nothing happens yet. That means that we have to develop this start room function. But don't worry, it will be very similar to the one we have already developed within the new meeting. So we can go to the meeting type list and search for the function we have here. Yeah, this will be good. So we can simply copy this await call that get or create. This is the only thing we need. We can paste it here and we need to get access to the call which we can do by saying const destructure the call and that's equal to use get call by ID. This is a special hook that we have created before. So we have to import it and we're going to pass the meeting ID as the parameter. And also to start calls, we need to have our video stream client coming from stream. So we can say const client is equal to use stream video client like this. And then we can check if there is no client or if there is no user, we can simply exit out of the function. But if we do have a client and the user, we can create a new call by saying that's equal to client dot call. That's going to be a default call with the ID of meeting ID like so. But if the call doesn't already exist, so if there is no call, in that case, we can await this thing that we have here and create a new call like so. So this can basically be within the if statement as well. And in this case, we don't need a description. And the starts at will simply be equal to new date dot to ISO string like this. So now we're either looking for an existing call or we're creating a completely new call that will act as our personal meeting room. Finally, we have to navigate to that meeting room by getting access to the router, which is equal to use router coming from next navigation. And then at the bottom right here, we can simply say router dot push and want to push to forward slash meeting forward slash we want to make this a dynamic string like this. Then it's going to be meeting ID question mark personal is equal to true. This will just allow us to know whether it's a personal meeting or not. So with that in mind, let's give it a spin. I'm going to click start meeting right here and we automatically get redirected to a new URL with our own custom user ID. And at the end it says personal is true. So now we can join that meeting. This is looking good. And we can share this link with other people that can immediately join our meeting as well. Great. So now let's exit out of it. 
And if I exited, it looks like I wasn't properly redirected. So we have to go back to our meeting page or our meeting room. And here to call controls, we have to pass a function that will allow us to leave the room. And we can do that by saying on leave is equal to a callback function where we need to call the router. So let's initialize the router at the top by saying const router is equal to use router coming from next navigation. And then we can say router dot push and we want to push to forward slash, which is the home page. So now if we go back to localhost 3000, Let's admire all of this in its full screen glory. We can go to upcoming, previous. Oh, previous fails right here. This is good because our personal meeting didn't have a description. So I'm glad we caught this. We can go to our previous page and then to the call list. And it looks like it's pointing to line 80. So right here under line 80, there we go. I think we need to add another question mark dot right here for the description. And then yet another question mark right here for the substring. Or maybe it's this second substring right here. So I'm going to add two more question marks right here. So it can say no description. There we go, no description. And now we know when this no description happens. It happens when it's a personal meeting. So we can simply say that personal meeting. There we go. That's great. So as I was saying, we have the beautiful homepage, upcoming, previous recordings. And now we also have this great looking personal room where we can copy the invitation, send it over to anyone so that they can join. And then once they do, we can immediately start a meeting. We can turn the camera off, join, and we can end the meeting right here and it will redirect us back to home. This is amazing. Now I have showed you all of the functionalities from the left sidebar, but let's not forget there's also the start and instant meeting, very similar to personal room, schedule meeting, where we can schedule it for a time in the future, view recordings, which for now doesn't do anything, and join meeting, which also doesn't do anything. So these are the two last missing pieces of the puzzle. So do you know where they are? Well, let's go to our home page and meeting type list. Right here at the bottom, we are creating different meeting models if we are scheduling the meeting and if we are creating an instant meeting, but we are not doing anything on view recordings or join meeting. So. Let's find this home card for view recordings. That one will be pretty simple. It is right here, view recordings. And on handle click, instead of setting the meeting state, we're going to simply call the router dot push. And we're going to push to forward slash recordings. That's it. Pretty simple, right? Because we already have this recordings page. So this will just act as a quick link to it. But what about join meeting? We want to open up some kind of a modal there, right? So let's do just that. Right at the bottom of this page, we can create a new meeting modal. We can definitely copy this one to give us some head start. Let's indent it properly. And this one will open if is joining meeting. For the title, it can say something like type the link here class name text center and button text join meeting. And the handle click will be a callback function of router dot push to values dot link. There we go. So now it says type the link here if you click it, but we don't yet have an input where to type it in and we don't know where this button would lead, right? So let's expand it so that it accepts children. And let's render a chat CN input field. I don't think we have installed inputs yet. But don't worry, it's pretty simple. A chat CN input is just a simple form input that looks like an input field like this. 
So let's install it by copying the command and pasting it right here. And we can also copy, or no, we don't have to copy anything. You simply call it like this. So let's call an input, import it from UI input. Let's give it a placeholder equal to meeting link. Now, if we go back and click join meeting, we can see the meeting link. Let's also give it a class name equal to border dash none, BG dark three, focus dash visible, ring zero, and focus dash visible, ring offset zero. As we discussed, this will remove that glow that happens once you click on it. And we have to give it an on change where we get an event and we set values where we destructure all the previous values and we set the link to be equal to e.target.value. Why is this important? Because we're using that link right here when we push to that meeting. So now let's say that somebody else shared with you their personal meeting link. The other person can now go here to their homepage, click join meeting and click join meeting. Oh, but it looks like nothing happens. So if we go back, we're passing this router that push to values link, but let's see whether the meeting modal is doing something with that handle click. So handle click is being used right here and the on click button has the handle click. Maybe we have to prepend it with HTTP colon forward slash forward slash for local host and click join meeting. And there we go. Now it works. The reason why it didn't work right off the bat is because we're still on local host. So we need that HTTP, but all of the future domains where we deploy this project will have that prepended. So I think it's going to work right off the bat, even for personal meetings. Now with that in mind, all of this is looking great. And finally, let's test out live functionalities with a couple of different users. And here we are. We have our own central screen right here, Devin Doe, who is sharing his microphone. We can see the audio right here. We can modify our devices. We can give some emojis to other people as well. We can share our screen too, which is pretty cool. You can choose to share a specific tab. There we go. And now you are presenting your screen with the video still on. That's great. So we can stop the screen sharing. You can see how here you can see different people as well. We can try to record some stuff as well. And it looks like it's just spinning around, but it is possible that it's recording in the background. We'll see later on if the recording actually shows up under our recordings. Now, another cool thing is that you can, of course, modify your camera and you can change the layout. So here we have a grid layout. So if you had like 10 or 20 people, this app would be able to support it all. We can have the speaker on the left side, always enlarged. And we can also have the speaker on the right while all of the other people are on the left. Not to mention that we can choose a specific user to pin in case you want to see their screen in more detail. There we go. The recording sign now looks good, which is always great. We can have different profile icons from different people right here. See the people's connectivity, status, microphone, and even more. We can see the live stats of our call with the latency, region, jitter, and even more, which is phenomenal. And at the end of the day, we can also expand the participants list to see exactly which users are in and we can even modify some of the stuff related to them. That is great. With that in mind, you have now successfully completed this video. So here's a little thumbs up and we can now focus on getting this project deployed. So let's do that next. To deploy our project, you can head over to GitHub and then create a new repository. Let's call it something like zoom underscore clone. I'm gonna make it public and create a repo. Next, we can follow the steps right here by opening up our terminal, removing the second terminal and stopping the original one from running. Then we can run git init, git add dot, git commit dash m first commit, 
git branch dash m main, git remote add origin, and git push u origin master. That's the only thing we have to do to get our code up on GitHub. Next, make sure to go to your .env.local and copy all of the variables from here. Next, head over to Vercel. You might not have this many projects, but I have quite a couple. Most of these projects are belonging to either our Ultimate Next.js course or to different teams and cohorts of our JSM Masterclass. I talked a bit about the Ultimate Next course, but I haven't mentioned the Masterclass so far. Right now, there's not a lot of info on the homepage. There might be at the time you're watching this video, but we have recently made significant improvements to the Masterclass, which if I had to summarize it, is JSM's project-based and career-focused bootcamp that helps you position yourself as an expert developer. So if you're interested, put your name and email right here. Now going back to the deployment of our project, let's click add new project, find one from your GitHub and click import. Then go to environment variables and add your ENVs right here. For now, let's click deploy. There we go. The deployment has started custom environment variables applied, and the app is building. Soon enough, it will start installing the dependencies, and I'll be right back. And there we go, our project has been deployed. So let's continue to dashboard, and it looks like the domain name has changed a bit. So we might want to modify our next public domain environment variable. So let's go ahead and copy the domain name from here, head over to settings, environment variables, and then find your next public base URL and edit it to be this new domain name that was given to you by Vercel. We need this to match our app exactly. Save it. And then let's go back to deployments and let's just redeploy the latest push so we're sure that the new environment variable will be applied. Let's give it about a minute and we should be able to see our app live and we are live. Let's go back to our project and let's click visit. There we go. We are immediately greeted by this beautiful clerk sign up page. So let's sign in or sign up with Google and we are back on our homepage. We can of course modify everything that has to do with our account and we can schedule a meeting for future. We can join a meeting or we can create a new meeting. Not to mention all of our meetings from before, like upcoming, previous recordings and more are right here. So let's go ahead and start a new meeting. There we go, our meeting has been created. And once again, we are asked whether we want to give permissions to camera. In this case, I will join with mic and camera off. And we're also asked for microphone permissions, which we can allow. Now let's try to just copy this link right here and share it to another person. And there we go. Looks like they're in. As you know, we can modify the grid, layout, microphone, camera, and every single little detail of our application. So let's end the call. And as you know, we built this using Clerk for simple but robust user management. And we have used streams, video, and audio APIs and SDKs for really an unparalleled video streaming experience. And with that in mind, you now know how to create these phenomenal video experiences and implement them within any app you can imagine. So if you're really watching at this point, and if you came to the end of this video, I really do know that you would be the perfect fit for the ultimate Next.js course. This video contained a lot of Next.js stuff, but still, there's only as much we can cover in this YouTube video. In the course, we go into much more depth into optimizations, SEO, server-side rendering, and deep dive with a lot of different animated graphics to really explain how Next.js works behind the scenes. And then you go ahead and build and deploy a 20 plus hour project, which is our flagship modern stack overflow clone application that looks something like this with server-side rendering all around, search, filtering, AI code generation, tags, recommended content, profiles, and even more, this is the perfect project for you to become an expert in Next.js. 
and lead all of these companies' future developments. With that in mind, thank you so much for watching this video and coming to the end of this amazing project, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a wonderful day.